Professor Tilker, can you hear us? Good morning. I think now I'll put it in a silent mode. <laughs> so that is best. You are on mute, ma'am. Professor Tilker. Uh, uh, yeah. Muting myself. Um, yes, hello. Yes, yes ma'am. Your video is also off. Yeah. Yeah. Simi, are you ready? Yes. Yeah, I am also ready. Yes, Professor Kelkar, if you can. Yes, this is good. But ma'am, you are still on mute. I. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she is. Think... Yes, it's it's good. Okay, all right. Okay, so ma'am, with your permission and Professor Patel's permission, shall we start? Yeah. Karuna Gandas and all those who wanted, I think they have done it. Okay. Yeah. ma'am? Yeah. They should start, right? Yeah. Me, please. Please allow me to share the screen. I tried seven, eight times to send PPT. It's not going. Even self email is not going. There is something wrong with uh, Gmail, I think. Yeah, ma'am, after the start, after chair remarks, we can yeah. share. Yes, yes, yes. Because yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A very good morning to everyone present here on Zoom and watching us live on Facebook Live. Um, almost uh, as India is looking towards uh, reaching 3 million cases of coronavirus positive patients, um, yeah, these are really and truly extraordinary times. And this, this has created a um, Conspicuous situation for both at uh, personal and professional places. Uh, uh, for example, there has been an increase in the incidences of uh, domestic violence and intimate partner violence within the households. And uh, also there have been an increase in the layoffs and loss of jobs for women and in the personal uh, spaces, in the professional spaces, excuse me. So uh, I would uh, refer this as a double loss for the women. And uh, it is increasingly being, uh, being summarized as uh, uh, the fact that women are finding their homes as uh, spheres of uh, anxiety and fear. To know more about uh, the gender implications of COVID-19 pandemic, I uh, request you all to put your hands together for the special lecture to be delivered by Professor Vibhuti Patel, which will be presided over by Professor Govind Kelkar. And we have a, a distinguished panelist who will, be, uh, who will be acting as discussants for the session. So on behalf of Gender Impact Studies Center, I wish you all a very good morning and welcome you all. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the chairperson for today, Professor Govind Kelkar who is also the chairperson of Gender Impact Studies at Impact and, Impact and Policy Research Institute, and also the executive director of Gen, Gender Research yeah, Center for Research and Innovation. Professor Kelkar has had several decades of her career devoted to the study of gender relations. And um, she specializes on gender relations, political economy of land rights, women's movements, and their comprehensive empowerment. Professor Kelkar has written uh, over 16 books and contributed numerous articles research in research journals and um, several uh, media pieces in national and international uh, platform. Professor Kelkar had, has also held very eminent positions both nationally and internationally. She has been a senior advisor to Landesa in um, Seattle in USA. She has been a senior advisor to the Economic Empowerment Unit of UN Women in, in uh, UN Women South Asia. She has been a visiting professor at Council for Social Development, among several others. Thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us this morning and for accepting our invitation to chair this session. With these remarks, uh, before I in uh, invite Professor Kelkar, I would request all the audience um, to uh, put down their questions on the chat box as and when um, you uh, you find it important and identify the panelist to whom the question is posed. So with this, I invite Professor Kelkar. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much, Dr. Simi Mehta. 
Uh, thank you for your very generous long introduction. I am very pleased and honored to chair this session on gender implications of COVID-19 by Professor Bibhuti Patel. We shared so much active kind of interactions in when I was in Bombay and also a bit in Delhi. And uh, I've known her for decades and I have been repeatedly impressed by her knowledge and commitment to women's movement and social change. Hmm. This lecture is of great significance in today's very uncertain, difficult time, how it has impacted women differentially because some people think that men also get affected and oh. layers of kind of uh, uh, layers of discrimination, layers of effects are lost in that kind of analysis. So Professor Patel is going to speak on the national and regional situation, but globally COVID-19 has continued to adversely affect lives and livelihoods of women and men. However, women were hit harder than men and have continued to be so. And some global data really shows, for example, I'll just briefly point out two, three things. Women made up 39% of the global employment, but, uh, but account for 54% of overall job losses. So you can see that they are 1.8 times more vulnerable to the COVID-19 crisis than men in this regard. This is the global data that shows so even before the COVID-19, research showed that progress towards gender equality had remained very slow and across the world. Uh, there were large gender gaps in women's employment caused by childcare burdens, masculine attitudes, inadequate um, employment, and the childcare burdens, um, private spending on services, lack of private spending on service, public and private spending on services such as education, childcare, and health. Now a slower recovery and increased care work of women made women leave labor market and subject to abuse at home. I am not really going to give a lecture on this, but what is important that two or three important factors come out globally and in India also, but particularly global situation. One is the increased care work of women. That is very much. Increased job losses of women uh, in comparative to men. Um, and uh, increased violence against women because of the being confined to home, men and child care. Largely it is related to increased care work of women. So that is uh, that is one fact, two factors that are important. Third important factor is also, there is a lot of industry mix and labor market specific data has come, which explains that um, one fourth of this effects, gender effects is really is in the job market, job losses for women. But what about that rest of the 75% of the world's total unpaid? And that is related to unpaid care work of women, which is not recognized in South Asia and uh, throughout the world, but particularly South Asia and MENA region. They are the worst affected in, the, <coughs> in this regard. Then there is a, a third important feature is the traditional attitudes and mindsets about the role of women. I'm so surprised if you read McKinsey report, if you read these reports that are coming out, now they have started talking about the traditional attitudes and mindsets about the role of women, where they should be, including the global world value survey shows that more than 50% of the respondents in South Asia and MENA region, they agree that men have more right to a job than women when the job are scarce. So these are the attitudes. So how in the coming years of automation transition, Particularly, we need to pay attention to these situations, the skills of women, the changing of the mindsets, where we have been sitting, my final point would be, in fact, if I look at South Asia as such, and particularly our country, we are in a mode of do nothing. We are paying attention to kind of crisis, but we are not doing women's unequal effects are also related to the 
effects of women's general effects of the position that they have been having and they are having. So uh, probably we will take these questions in conclusion, which I request to the panelists and others. And I'm sure Vibhuti Patel is going to take this that take action now. So somehow these reports are being divided do, that we are, countries are in the two modes, do nothing scenario and the second scenario is take action now. And particularly South Asia is in the mode of do nothing about it. And so these are the, some webinars are there, some decorative kind of uh, questions are done by uh, government agencies, but Nothing goes beyond that, this decorative kind of situation with regard to the gender equality. Thank you. I request Professor Vibhuti Patel to take over now. Uh, uh, Professor Kelkar, your camera, if you can put your screen thoda sa niche. Um, your half face is now no, much better. Okay. I thought to interject in between, but... Uh, 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 Simi, with the introduction of Professor Patel, yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, in the meantime, Professor Patel, when I introduce, you can put on your screen and then uh, after I end, you can, I'll give you a heads up. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kelkar, for your initial opening remarks. As always, it is very pertinent and it provides food for thought for uh, the next, uh, for the next follow-up discussions. So thank you again. So I have the uh, privilege to introduce to you the, uh, select, uh, the speaker for today's special lecture, Professor Vibhuti Patel. She is professor in the Advanced Center for Women's Studies at the School of Development Studies at Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Professor Patel holds a PhD in economics from University of, of Mumbai. She was awarded the visiting fellowship to the London School of Economics and Political Science uh, uh, from Association of Commonwealth Universities in United Kingdom uh, in 1992 and 93. Professor Patel has authored and co-authored several books and several over 100 papers uh, and as chapters in various books edited by others. She has authored and co-authored in fact 12 books herself she has authored and co-authored 34 research monographs and reports. Her research papers, comments, and commentaries and reviews have been published in national and international academic journals. She has also prepared several modules for um, uh, the U University Grants Commission for master's, master's degree courses on women's studies. And she has also been a writer for nine modules and reviewer of 11 modules. She has also recorded videos of these um, uh, modules and for various courses in adult continuing and educa extension education. And she has presented these um, uh, courses as modules. Professor Patel has received prestigious citations and awards, for example, from the Mahila Sangh, the Buns Association, Mumbai. She has received citation from Men Against Violence and Abuse, Mumbai, on its 20th anniversary celebration in 2013. She has received a citation when One Billion Rising campaign was launched in um, November 2012 in Mumbai. She has, been, she has been awarded the social sector work from the uh, mayor of Mumbai, uh, of municipal, Mumbai Municipal Corporation in 2011. She has received the Outstanding Citizenship Award by Women's Poli Women Political Forum on Maharashtra uh, Stri Mukti Din, which is celebrated on 3rd January. Uh, this was awarded to her in the year 2004. She has also received a, an award for Women Achievers from Young Environmentalist Program Trust, Mumbai. She has received the Times Foundation Award for Women's Achievers in March 2007. She has received awards for social work from Vanita Samaj in Mumbai. And she has also received award for postdoctoral uh, fellowship from Association of Commonwealth University, which enabled her to work as visiting faculty at the Development Studies Institute at the London School of Political Science into the uh, Economics and Political Science in 1992-93. Professor Patel is member of the editorial board of several reputed national and international journals. And she has prepared her base paper on gender for Mumbai Human Development Report in 2010, Maharashtra Human Development Report, the MMRDA Human Development Report for Government of Maharashtra. 
she has contributed three chapters for expert committee report on socio economic status of muslims in maharashtra for maharashtra state minority commission government of maharashtra with these few words i um, i invite professor vibhuti patel and i thank on behalf of the organizers thank you very much ma'am for joining us this morning and for accepting our invitation over to you ma'am thank you very much uh, dr sri uh, first of all i would like to uh, like very good morning to professor govin kelkar who set the tone for today's webinar uh, and respected dr arjun kumar uh, dr simi mehta dr um, and all the st uh, discussant especially my co colleague at tiss now i have super annuity but still i am uh, supervisor for phd and mphil course at tiss so, professor samapti guha Uh, professor Banvan Singh Mehta, Dr. M. S. Urvashi Prasad, Professor I. C. Avasti, uh, M. S. Uh, Maitri, and uh, my old friend, very very old friend, Indu Prakash. Uh, I think I am really honored that in this think tank uh, I am invited to present the views on gender issues because the mainstream discourse has completely invisibilized gender concerns. Uh, so here I would like to share the screen. Uh, is it visible? is my ppt visible yes. yeah so i think we all have uh, so gender impact of covid-19 has been deliberated mostly in the feminist circles and now to some extent social movements are also giving platform to voice the gender concerns all of us have been through uh, like four phases of lockdown and now we are in the third phase of uh, unlock period and gender well, in the past also gender implications of pandemics and epidemics whether it was a smallpox epidemics or a plague epidemic savitri bai phule died while serving the patient in the camp you know at the time of uh, uh, plague uh, during colonial times we have had pandemics of uh, tuberculosis in africa we had a pandemic of uh, uh, ebola and asian countries also experienced uh, sars pandemic but both the economic historians as well as the um, uh, health historians history of medicine you hardly see gender concerns being uh, discussed it was only for the first time that in ebola at the time of ebola the maternal deaths were extremely high and women delivered babies with uh, a small brain and that was the time the gender concerns especially from the context of reproductive health uh, were discussed uh, this is for the first time like we see that right from january because of the initiative of un women and what the statistics that dr professor govin kelkar also told us that from the very beginning the rapid assessment surveys of uh, uh, member countries of the un some 182 countries which are facing the influence and very very dire influence of uh, coronavirus uh, have been like advisories and the oped are being uh, circulated globally covid virus as you, everybody says that it has impacted uh, economy society and also the governance structures in a very big way macro economy start concern more only about the fiscal de deficit and uh, what will be the impact on the gdp uh, that that is the concern while the healthcare emergency has also created a massive staff uh, shortage more than 50% of the post in public health sector are not filled due to budgetary cuts that also brings to uh, 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 to the focus uh, what professor kelkar told us about the unpaid care work because most of them first we talked about social isolation then we talked about home isolation and now we are talking about the home care home based care so even the patients in corona because the health, public health system is just unable to cope up with the uh, with the, the enormity of the uh, health emergency that we are facing uh and that too when the public health uh, system with whatever its limitations is the only system available private care health care has already washed off his hands if if you take the data from bombay today's papers front line news is that 41% of the deaths uh, due to corona uh, uh, is the, the private sector nursing homes are responsible because they are just not following the uh, any of the advisories or the uh, uh, safety measures that Uh, they are supposed to take so now today there is a ban from today there is a ban in admitting any covid patient in the private health sector most of the private uh, nursing homes clinics and uh, hospitals were closed only when the state governments are forcing them they are willy nilly agree to do that so then the burden falls only on the public health sector which gets less than 2% of gdp 
even when it comes to the rural area stoppage of uh, mg narega has also created major uh, incidences of hunger and starvation the recent data uh, globally is also showing that uh, nutritional standards of women and children has gone down drastically in indian context indian women eat last list and leftover so you can imagine that in the uh, context of scarcity uh what 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 is happening at the ground level and also what we see is that adaptability of the corrupt forces and the rent seeking behavior and here we just can't say that public sector or versus private sector nobody is uh, the the holier than thou argument will not work because both the public sectors as well as private sector have sh uh, shown rent seeking behavior whether it is by the public hospitals or the private every public hospital beds are empty inside uh, all the confined uh, 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 containment zones where uh, where the uh, cares, uh, the shelter and care is provided they are underutilized so many of them are but the touts are outside there the gatekeepers are asking for 2 lakhs for hospital admission so that is happening in public hospital and also the private uh, health seeker for just uh, two line of certificate that this migrant workers is fit to travel they are charging between 2500 to 4000 rupees we have seen it and finally it is the ngos the uh, health move organizations and the organizations like doctors without border and medical friends circle they had to organize the camp uh, in the basti uh, in in the slums uh, to for the migrant workers to uh, to get the health certificate and the paperwork for anything that you do because of the barriers and nakabandis created everywhere the the complete license permit raj which everyone abhorred in the in the early 90s i think that has come back Uh, even the transport sector, I think that is also massive rent seeking behavior. Hardly for two kilometers of uh, distance, uh, taxi drivers would ask for say two thousand rupees. Imagine it would be hardly twenty two rupees. It should be, but in in such times, you you feel uh, you th this kind of behavior is happening, and it is in this context that we need to see the gender differential impact. Uh, that uh, first of all, this whole question of a social distancing that itself is a highly contentious term because it has a very painful legacy of caste system in India because all the upper castes and savarnas were asked to maintain social distance from the shudras and ati shudras. So that uh, the 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 term itself has been highly opposed, but still the official discourse uh, is uh, rife with this use of this term. Uh, and even the media is using social distancing nobody uses the term body distancing or physical distancing even after the advisory given by by world health organization by i think by by june july end the new poster was given globally also this term has been highly opposed in the context of history of racism and apartheid now according to the statement by the un, UN women what was issued on 20th of march uh, and and when the new website was launched by the un women just to focus on covid 19 which has shared that it has a profound shock uh, the covid 19 has given a pro profound shock not only to societies and economies but women are the heart of care and response efforts underway as frontline respondents health professionals community volunteers transport and logistic managers scientists and also women are making critical contribution to address out outbreak every day most caregivers at home and in our countries are also women additionally they are at risk of infection loss of livelihood existing trend points to less access to sexual and reproductive health and rise in domestic violence all these issues i think uh, uh, in in her introductory remark dr govind kelkar also talked about and women workers have been disproportionately affected by job loss reduced working hours and bankruptcy and that i think even the rapid assessment studies in our country by by indian social studies trust uh, i wage uh, feminist policy collective and uh, seva are also showing the major job loss that women are facing if we go through the whole historical legacy like from 2000 to 2019 also we have seen continuous decline of work participation of women and the major reason so many there is a fikki report or a mckinsey report all of them are showing majorly four reasons one is a uh, 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 marriage and maternity that is a one very important reason some people are talk, the uh, fikki report also talks about the uh, uh, upward mobility of the middle class and in the there is a prosperity effect where women are pulled out of Work, that is a very minuscule proportion, uh, and then the question of a childcare, and also the population pyramid has become top heavy. We have more elderly people, and the birth rate uh, is has gone down. Sixteen states have a below stabilization. 
total fertility rate. That means couples are producing less than two children. So the question and the life expectancy has increased. So in this context also, the elderly care has emerged as a major issue and uh, safety of women after nearby uh, from 2013, we see a massive fall from 34% to 23% that uh, safety concerns are also uh, very important when it comes to uh, 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 women who are working away from their home in the other city or other place. So that has affected. And the, uh, and the last one is op automation, the massive automation that is coming up, introduction of artificial intelligence, robotics in the manufacturing sector. All these four factors are affecting women's work participation. But uh, globally also, if we do the comparison, India has one of the lowest uh, uh, work participation rate. Now it has gone even below Pakistan. Earlier, we, Pakistan was below us. So now 23%, uh, this, this is the 2019 statistic. Uh, in economic times, it came in the uh, yeah. May 2020. Now, gendered experiences of COVID-19 pandemic uh, have been seen in, in terms of the intersection of inequalities in the labor market. Labor markets, there are no free forces. Labor markets are socially constructed and they are determined by the segmentation in the labor market is determined by the uh, layers of gender, class, caste, region, location, whether you are in rural area or urban area, which part, whether you are in the more industrialized and urbanized states or where, you, where the economy is dependent just on subsistence and access to the digital world. I think that is also very important in today's context. Intra-household power relations during stay at home and the lockdown orders in matters concerning care or who shares the major responsibility, what is the stress level of each and every member of the family uh, according to the demands both physical emotional uh, psychological demands made on them and the question of domestic violence which has been declared by the UN as a shadow pandemic uh, working from home along with housework and the gendered experiences of household responses there are several studies uh, which have come up rapid assessment studies both globally as well as in our country which also shows that me, women are shouldering major burden uh, domestic violence, sexual violence, child sexual abuse in the camps, in the shelter homes, and uh, also the mental health issues have been reported over the last four months. Personal care and the frontline health care services to the family members, because whenever anything goes wrong, it's the women who are in the physical proximity of the family members. And government intervention for food security also varies in different states and different regions. Uh, shelter for homeless migrant workers there also we have seen some states have completely washed off their hands from providing uh, the homeless migrants who could not pay the rent and they were thrown out by their landlords. Testing for coronavirus and other social policies, I think we have seen how the nurses and ASHA workers and uh, uh, frontline workers uh, periodically are most because it is not the super specialist and the uh, deans and uh, HODs of the medical colleges who are uh, frontline workers. It is the basically medical students, nurses. They are there in so many places. The nursing students have also roped, roped in for frontline work. And they, uh, they, they have not got the uh, social protect, they have not neither got social protection nor the personal protection equipment. Most of them are managing with the, uh, with the mask only, Many, even hand gloves are not given. Impact of shift in priorities of public health services regarding non-coronavirus patients, like in so many states after states, maternity wards were converted into COVID wards. So imagine what would happen. And we have seen all those horror stories and pictures and videos about women running, women in labor being taken from one hospital to other hospital, she doesn't get admission. Differential impact of COVID-19 infection and also the resultant mortality and morbidity rates uh, by gender, caste, ethnicity and class. I think that is also very important concern. We have seen that who are the people who are, who are dying basically age by We see generally it is age, uh, the senior citizens who are uh, with comorbidities, uh, their death rate is higher, but we have also seen that the areas in which the hygienic condition is very deplorable, there also the deaths have increased. In fact, the, 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 the reported cases of deaths among the sanitation workers, and especially women sanitation workers, are also high. As for the Safai Karmachari, uh, 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 All India Safai Karmachari Sangatan, uh, headed by Bezwada Wilson. 
Now, gender stereotypes are very, very, they have pronounced in today's context and the unpaid care work has also increased as Professor Govind Kilkar told us. As care work is stereotyped as a women's domain around the world, women spend two to 10 times more time and unpaid care work than men. And this unequal distribution of caring responsibility is linked to discriminatory social institutions and also stereotypes on, of gender roles. And I would quote, like to quote UN Women data on 30th of, uh, which was released on 30th of April. Uh, the data from rapid assessment surveys also show that in all countries, women are more likely to see increase in both unpaid domestic work and unpaid care work since the spread of COVID-19. In addition, they are also more likely than men to say they are in charge of performing all three activities, unpaid childcare, unpaid adult care, and unpaid domestic work. On the contrary, men tend to concentrate on fewer tasks like shopping for the household and playing with the children. This is based on data from uh, rapid assessment survey of uh, 182 countries. Now, uh, this is the uh, uh, Indian data, which says that uh, vast majority of Indian earn less than 10 percent, uh, 10,000 rupees. It was in 2015 NSSO data on X, uh, and uh, women, 92 percent of the women in informal sector, they earn less than 10,000 and 82 percent men uh, 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 earn less than 10,000 rupees. And if we see the time spent by urban worker in unpaid care work is only 29 minutes, while the urban woman uh, would be a worker is spending 312 minutes. In the rural areas, urban male worker spends 32 minutes in unpaid care work, while the rural uh, uh, unpaid care work, uh, 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 rural worker, woman worker spends 291 minutes for unpaid care work. Now, if these are the officially given data uh, by the one of the most reputed uh, data agency, data gathering agency of the government. And still we see that none of the corporate sector, Fortune 500 companies have taken into consideration that in the context of this pandemic, how much unpaid work, the women's unpaid work has increased manifold, but only two companies, one Tata still, which talked about the special leave and fully paid leave for quarantine without any time limit, all, uh, uh, all other regular leaves to uh, remain unaffected. So that means their CL and uh, casualty leave and sick leave will not be affected and the special leave will be granted under the COVID pandemic. Swiggy also rolled out a uh, quarantine leave policy and it did that. Uh, so I think these are the only two companies which are which uh, which have responded and ex acknowledged that recognize the unpaid care work of women and provided special measures. When it comes to frontline worker, like we have a registered. When it comes to officially, we have a nine lakh public health women uh, public health workers. Women, uh, women as a healthcare providers make up to seventy percent of the frontline healthcare. Uh, workforce as doctors, nurses, ayabai, sanitary workers. Now, if we add Anganwadi workers, we have around 27 lakhs Anganwadi workers working for integrated child development program. And we have 10.3 lakh accredited uh, ASHA workers in National Rural Health Mission. And if we also include PDS, uh, the distribution of PDS done by the school teachers, uh, they, 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 that is also a very big, they are also the frontline health workers who are completely neglected. Even among the school teachers, women have more than 50% of the, uh, pro pro the proportion of women is more than 50% in the school education. Now, coming to women in formal sector, uh, they are facing uh, increased domestic care burden in the wake of children and earning members being confined to home after lockdown and making multiple demands. Middle and upper class educated women employed uh, who are working from home as they have information technology enabled communication channels. They, are also, they also must juggle with housework, childcare, homeschooling, and office work without support of domestic work. But still, they are relatively better off because they are economically secure. Media coverage is also a lot of uh, positive coverage about how people are bonding and they are uh, interacting with each other, care, taking care of elderly, uh, intergenerational dialogues are happening. So that, that we, we have here all those uh, uh, very, very, uh, uh, the rosy picture of the middle class homes. But when it comes to women in informal sector, most of the workforce in India is in unorganized sector. And I would like to quote uh, international labor organizations data. The unorganized sector workers plus informal sector, informal workers in the organized sector has remained relatively stable in Indian economy at 92%. 
this is in 2017 within overall category of informal sector the largest group is own account workers that means nearly one third 32 uh, percent followed by informal employees in informal sector that means working in the micro small and medium uh, industries uh, they are also not they do and most of the employers uh, avoid uh, employing more than uh, 10 workers and now with the labor code and the new uh, uh, 12 states have already abandoned 48 labor laws uh, and 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 then you have a, one whole category of uh, unpaid family workers which is 18% this informalization has been more pronounced in case of women workers uh, in india 94% of women are employed in unorganized sector and involved in the work which lacks dignity of labor social security decent and timely wages and in some cases even the right to be called workers so you have sectors like a uh, uh, construction industry where you have a jodi system naka workers have jodi system in in a uh, maharashtra which has more than 3 lakh uh, sugarcane workers they uh, they have a jodi system where the male worker only has identity has a face is considered as a worker the woman is not uh, this thing there is and that's why all the labor laws and the protective labor legislations have been flouted when it comes to women workers pandemic has had a dire implication for this vulnerable populations for example women headed households households managed by divorced or uh, single widowed and deserted women people with disability pregnant women uh, homeless people lonely elderly socially stigmatized transgender community and sex workers prisoners and inmates in overcrowded shelter homes and uh, makeshift tents in fact in a big uh, uh, prison in maharashtra yarawada jail uh, one third of the prisoners have been identified as covid po- coronavirus positive informal sectors workers such as daily wage earners head loaders construction workers street vendors domestic workers uh, small scale manufacturing workers in recycling scrape and uh, garment industries barbers and security guards who manage their survival by daily or weekly or monthly income they have nothing left due to unemployment and confinement uh, over uh, a month this is a study by uh, 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 the observation research foundation moreover the same the study by seva and indian social studies trust i wage feminist police collective they also corroborate uh, this findings Uh, the challenges for the migrant workers i think lot has been discussed for the first time during this covid pandemic we are discussing about migrant workers uh, in a very very serious way uh, and all the social movements as well as the government organizations they have started now thinking about the macro policies the state governments have been energized they are galvanized into action so far as the migrant workers are concerned uh, we have seen by and large responsible uh, and very proactive media coverage mainstream media has also reported both visual Uh, and also the very detailed report and the case studies and profiles have been given and the social media coverage has also been very very strong a uh, very uh, vivid picture of the problems faced by migrant workers in terms of homelessness hunger walking for miles together so hundreds of miles that is there the question of shelter has also become very very important uh, because of the uh, homelessness created for the informal sector workers who could not pay their rent even the lower middle class felt the pinch and the major question that state has to now step in because the private uh, construction lobby or the private uh, sector is not going to, uh, to 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 provide any kind of a support to Uh, uh, to to the, to the marginalized section and the state has to think about the low cost it is not a question of housing uh, property right it is a question of housing right that means the low cost low rent housing uh, has to be provided by the state uh, in a, and also the public sector enterprises have already received their their uh, the directive from the uh, ministry of urban affairs universalization of pds without conditionality of eligibility criteria of identification and domicile after dissemination of a uh, lot of rapid assessment studies done by say swan report or the ngos and cbos they did it uh, the the many like, first eight states responded that they would not ask for uh, any kind of aadhar or a ration card the list of beneficiary to be prepared but for the collector's office i think that was very very important thing that had to be done but it was basically the civil society organizations who stepped in 
for need assessment study. Uh, uh, availability of water tanker, mobile toilets, distribution of masks, I think that was a very important thing, which first it was the civil society organizations and the non-state actors who stepped in and then slowly and gradually state, uh, the local cell government body started entering. But in all these women were the last to be taken care of. The uh, health post of government organizations and the role of private sector healthcare services has been uh, debated in a, uh, uh, greatly that how the, they all of them could not meet the challenges and only the, the Corona warriors were basically the civil society organization. Report, reproductive and child health was a major casualty because all the uh, ICDS centers were stopped, midday meals stopped, uh, the, the regular medical service, uh, health services, which in terms of a tetanus injection to the woman in a third trimester of pregnancy or a neonatal care, giving a vaccine, polio vaccine or other vaccine, all that for four months stopped. So I think that is a major, major uh, uh, challenge that we are facing now. Helpline for counseling services of children, for survivor of violence, students, mental health issues due, uh, created due to distress, uh, uh, due to social isolation. I think that there also we see the state response was very, very slow. National Commission for Women at least took one month to put the system in place uh, at the state commissions for women also uh, 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 also started uh, later on joined in. Six states provided uh, uh, one-stop crisis centers in the hospital, uh, but the gatekeeping was so, so, so strong that we, uh, women in difficulty were not allowed in uh, by, by, the, by the gatekeepers because of the uh, fear and the coronaphobia. Uh, reverse migration, I think the repatriation of rural homes for, of the extended families where the focus of the discussion was only on the male migration. And all the studies on migration also show women, like 85% women migrate due to marriage. But even after marrying, they, wherever they go, they are working. So women as a worker, women as a contributor to the economy, that was not brought out. And unresolved issue of a payment of all arrears to the workers by their employers, even the domestic work ISST study shows that 85% of the women domestic workers were not paid their salary for the month of March, April, May, June, and July. And uh, so I think that is a major uh, and same was the scenario in the small small scale industry and the uh, unorganized sector. Uh, when it comes to migrant women, like we have three uh, crore migrant women in India, 85% they are supposed to have migrated due to marriage, but they are wherever they go, they work. The migrant workers, the daily wage earners or organized sector workers, including self-employed women and men have been worst hit due to loss of wages, no money to pay rent to the, for the house, uh, to buy daily necessities, exposure to hunger, no access to water resulting in dehydration, malnutrition, infection, and worst of all, police brutality as most of them tried to go to the native place uh, as they had nothing to survive in the neoliberal decision makers of uh, urban local self-government bodies. They were initially concerned only about the middle, middle and upper class uh, strata of the society living in the gated communities. So the whole thing about the social isolation, what they talked about, only gated communities could afford to uh, ma maintain one, one meter distance. In the Basti, when 42... 50% of the Indians in the urban areas, they stay in the slums. How can they maintain social distancing? And, 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 and the, the kind of uh, repression was let loose on the people in the Basti. I think that, are, that, the, that, that is really now for the first time, like this month, the National uh, Human Rights Commission has appointed a special 21 member committee to examine the gross violation of human rights that happened during lockdown. Uh, in the metropolis where uh, nearly half of the population lives in the slum, how can they maintain so-called social distance? Uh, and, and it is also a misnomer. Uh, so I think that is very, very important thing that we need to keep into mind. And all these pictures, you must be familiar that uh, women, it was only the visual depiction which brought out that the kind of uh, problems that women face, you can see even in the truck, men are at the corner where they can get air and they can breeze. Women are cramped in the middle. And I think they also told when they, when they were interviewed by, 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 by the women's organization that it was so difficult for them. So they were finding it so suffocating and they also face a sexual uh, harassment and violence while traveling. 
and the consequences of reverse migration have been documented greatly in terms of uh, senior women delivering on the road or senior citizens being carried by young people, children falling ill, person with disability somehow managing to uh, escape, robbery, extortion, theft, sexual violence, child sexual abuse, suicides, road accidents, train accidents, trafficking of women and children have been reported widely. Uh, in this whole de de depressing scenario, what we what was energizing was an unassuming social solidarity that came. Kerala was the first one to uh, coin new term instead of calling them migrant workers, they called them guest workers. And we also saw that so many other, uh, 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 in Maharashtra, uh, 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 Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, where the politicians and the elected representatives were accessible to the civil society. And so many NGOs and community-based organization, neighborhood organization, they came up to run the camp camps with 1,200 workers providing meals to 20,000 workers in a and It was a tiny little organizations like Garbachao, Garbanao, or the Citizens for Justice, which were spontaneously formed at the time of lockdown. And they played a very important role. Uh, we also saw all these migrant workers who were who managed to get their accommodation in the shelter camp. They also were pitching in. All of them were highly dignified, and they said they had never. They, they are not used to sitting idle, and they were also contributing unpaid work, uh, both in terms of cooking, cleaning, caring of the people who were ill in the camp. Uh, so many uh, organizations, uh, women's organizations, students' organizations, they also got galvanized into action for a need assessment uh, of uh, socially excluded people like uh, uh, women-headed household or single women or transgender community or the sex workers and that's why we saw that lot of volunteerism that was also shown by the by the students in terms of uh, 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 providing uh, uh, their uh, uh, vehicles or their time uh, for relief operations, uh, volunteering for community kitchen, doing the networking with the supply chain of grocers, farmers, small producers, corporate, coordinating with the government organizations for the regular supply of LPG and water in the shelter camps. Uh, then micro planning, need assessment, identification of a specific needs of specific households. What, what are the needs of the elderly people? Uh, medicines that is required by diabetic or heart patient, person with disability, those who are excluded, like while doing the relief work, they were, they were told that it is in a Harijan Basti where no ration has been supplied because this community, there are religious minorities, no ration is supplied. So this kind of a report, which the students uh, volunteers brought out uh, that, that also helped in making targeted intervention and a lot of, of, of uh, audiovisual clips, messages, and the uh, uh, reports were prepared. So I think that was quite unassuming. The children who were otherwise would only talk about going to cafe coffee day or just uh, loitering or going for a ride. They were the ones who used all the resources for the relief operation. Now coming to the question of uh, health uh, concerns and the public, how the public health uh, concerns of women were taken care of. So we see that uh, according to the data from 1st April to 10th June by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare showed that the national average of estimated number of pregnant women registered with ministry were only 24%. That means 3 fourth percent of the pregnant women just lost out because of the services were closed. Uh, maternity wards were converted into COVID ward and ICDS centers where the pregnant women and lactating mothers go, they were also closed down under lockdown. While and only COVID-19 services or health services were considered to be the emergency services and essential services. And the newborn only 17.47% were reported. Uh, in other words, 76% of, in other words, like 76% of pregnant women and 83% of newborn children, we just don't have any data about them. What happened to them? Whether they delivered at home, or whether they delivered in the camp, whether, so currently nobody knows. Uh, it is not uh, known if 83% of these estimated childbirths have received any vaccination, uh, polio vaccination, triple vaccination, or any other required emergency medical care, whether they were born uh, LBW babies, they were, they were the, 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 any kind of a medical emergency that they faced, and country doesn't know how many of them have even survived. So even the uh, child mortality and maternal mortality data currently we don't have of last four months. 
Now, women in agrarian sector, we saw that in the March when the lockdown was uh, declared, it was a rabi harvesting. First time we say that uh, agriculture has done very well. Even the yesterday's report said that even in the midst of lockdown, supply chain in of export of agrarian goods has not reduced. On the contrary, there is a 24% rise in that. And what was happening to these women in agriculture sector at three, three levels they faced uh, in the agrarian sector, women get unequal wages. They are not registered even as a worker so, uh, or a farmer. So the, 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 the schemes which are there for the Kisan card, women don't have. A report by the Makam. Makam has released, Mahila Kisan Mazdur Sangatna has released three reports which show that women have completely lost out in the rural areas. Women have lost out uh, during the lockdown. They are the worst sufferers in terms of loss of wages, loss of uh, any form of livelihood of even unpaid uh, things like a collection of fuel, fodder, water animal care and livestock raising and kitchen gardening, all of that, that suffered. Uh, women also eat last feast and leftover and that's why the nutrition suffered and reproductive health care was uh, completely neglected. Uh, it was only the ASHA workers who did the handholding. They also had in even delivering babies in the farm or in the uh, home. Uh, when it comes to forest economy, we know 11% of Indian tribal population is in the rural areas. Uh, most of the tribal women, they do the collection of non-timber forest uh, product. Uh, over 200 types of uh, recognized minor forest products are collected by them, whether it's a tendu leaf, bamboo, mahua, uh, chironji, uh, then tamarind, gum. And Trefed, uh, Tribal Cooperative Marketing Development Federation has said that uh, the, the contribution of these 55 forest, uh, forest products is also to the tune of 20,000 crore. And uh, some 13 minor forest products contribute to 3,802 crores. But still, uh, and all these collection, they, they, they could not sell. Uh, and, and, the, and they have asked for it, especially for the tendu leaves, the, the tribal organizations have asked for uh, uh, reduction in the tax and no GST to be charged, but they have not been granted that. And a lot of now you must have seen recently uh, there are in, in the month of August, so many webinars have taken place where the tribal people's organizations are fighting for their uh, rights. Women as healthcare seekers have, uh, during this lockdown, they have also suffered a lot in terms of complete neg neglect of the menstrual hygiene. Uh, sanitary pads were not declared as essential services. It was the NGOs which started distributing uh, sanitary pads and they prevailed upon the local cell government bodies to provide sanitary pads to women. Another thing is about the uh, general service of a non-COVID related services. They were basically, it was a home-based care which they took and uh, also what we saw, the reproductive health care uh, suffered the most because women, uh, the, the miscarriages, unsafe deliveries, neonatal care, uh, deaths, maternal mortality, maternal morbidity, because if you're in an unhygienic condition, women delivered the babies in a, except there was no aseptic environment in which the babies were delivered. In so many places, women themselves, the woman after delivering the baby, she only was asked to clean the baby and also uh, clear, clear the placenta and all. So we saw the maternal morbidity cases, the infection, reproductive health infections, uh, self deliveries uh, uh, in self delivery cases, have also increased and that's why the women's organization and the health organizations have demanded special dedicated helpline for pregnant women. Uh, learning through electronic media is another major casualty that, that, uh, for women's education. So education through creation of educational uh, radio program or television channel would have been more appropriate because we have used, we all know, my generation knows that countrywide classroom was so popular, UGC's program, Education Media Research Center, uh, EMARC by NCRT, which was used for annual education program would have been far more effective to, to, to prevent dropout of uh, children from the poverty groups as well as the women. Uh, latest analysis, but the focus was on online education uh, during this uh, lockdown. The latest NSSO data on household social consumption on education in India reveals stark gender gap in computing ability across states, location, sector, and sociocultural and religious groups. Despite the proliferation of internet connectivity, computing ability among women is far lower than men. In India, about 21.96 percent, around 22 percent of men above 14 uh, age, uh, of the years of age have computing ability, while the figure for women is only 13.12 percent. So you can see that such a wide. Uh, in this context, uh, we have what we saw that online education 
in this context of digital divide, I think has created a situation where more girls have dropped out of schools and colleges. And we are also seeing an increase in the underage and forced marriages. Like you know, uh, one state alone has reported around 16,000 complaints of uh, from young girls, adolescent girls of getting forced into uh, marriage child helpline, like child line, which is managed by, by, by Ministry of Women and Child Development. They are also inundated by the panic calls and the distress calls from these young girls who are forced to marry a 50 year old, a 16 year old girl would be married, forced to marry a 50 year old uh, uh, man just for money because that is the, and, and giving away the girl. Uh, who was earlier working as a domestic worker or working in the farm, they, under the lockdown, she's seen as a burden and she is not even going to school. Now, coming to the most important uh, concern about the violence against women, which is escalated due to the uh, social isolation under the lockdown, because in a normal circumstances, women seek help, their neighbors intervene, so they, they can run out uh, run away from the tormentor, but the, the, the conditionality of the lockdown and the social isolation also where nobody pitches in, you, you scream, but there is nobody to respond to your help. And it is only the women's rights organizations throughout the country who are training the volunteer that how could they help someone in trouble by using sign language or by connecting them with the uh, women's helpline. Uh, that is very, very important. Then the, uh, we also saw a boys locker room phenomena happening at the ISTA group during COVID-19 pandemic among the students of elite call, uh, school. We had similar thing happening in Mumbai also uh, last year. And the, the boy who revealed this information to her journalist mother, he also said that this, this is not only one ISTA group, there are several such WhatsApp and ISTA group uh, where, uh, where, where they brutalize young girls, they, they uh, morph images and, and uh, uh, circulate pornography, and they also conspire to, to, to seduce a girl and uh, rape her. They, they, the discussions of those types are going on. So organized trolling, fake information uh, that is also happening under cyber crime. This is the bar chart given by National Commission for Women. And it shows the difference between last year and this year. The blue, uh, blue uh, bar is about uh, this year, that variety uh, of incidences of violence, whether it is a domestic violence or harassment of married women where, who have been separated because if the husband is a, in, in other, other village, like recently, we got this week only the case in Raigar district where a whole cluster of community where men are in Gulf countries, they are under lockdown, they are stuck there. And here are only women and children taking advantage of this uh, helplessness Antisocial elements started harassing them. The question, the the, the complaint came to the uh, state commission for women, and now the the, the uh, state government is taking measures. So police apathy uh, that is also there because currently the police is also considers only corona related issue as a very important nakab and the curfew rules they are overworked with that and they are also not paying attention. Uh, rape uh, and attempt to rape have been reported by migrant women who try to take, uh, try to go either while walking on the highway or in a truck driver, truck driver would stop the truck in the middle of the forest and you, the volunteers of the uh, women's organization would get panic calls about of the sexual assault that they were facing. So right to live with dignity has been compromised and sexual assault and sexual harassment, online sexual harassment also, like presenting pornographic image when women are working, that has also increased uh, in, uh, during the pandemic. And that's why both the government organizations and NGOs, civil society and the elected representatives and all uh, we have to work together and the pathways of linking pandemic and violence against women and children is very important. It is neither one is not less important than the other, or we have to fight against COVID and we also have to fight against violence against women. And I think globally also, this is the, uh, the understanding that we have arrived. So pathways can be both direct and indirect and are likely to interact and reinforcing existing vulnerabilities and inequalities. And pathways are not exhaustive and will depend on the type of pandemic and context, contextual factors, including the underlying gender norms and the level of violence in a different states, in a different locations that we are facing. The first response to violence against women came from the women's organizations all over India. Delhi, it was Shakti Shalini, which contacted all the 
uh, women's rights organization providing institutional support to women in distress and they came up with the mobile this whole poster was a release in 10 days of lockdown and they were not only responding to cases of violence but they were also responding to the distress calls from the stranded migrant students domestic workers daily wage workers hungry people in the slums and flats and in the even in the affluent area if my young mother did not have milk to feed the baby they were also attended to and uh, so many educational and social work institutions, they also started helpline responding to distress call. IS, TISS was the first uh, institution to start I call service, which was nationally connected. And they were also counselors who were speaking in several Indian languages, lifelong learning departments of uh, various universities. Uh, IIT Delhi also came up with the helpline. Mm -hmm. uh, and many animation films were created uh, to explain the complex, demystify all the advisories and the complex that, that this thing given by the state. Helpline, this is the, the such newspaper advertisements also appeared about the various helplines for people in difficult circumstances. And that's why I think the, what that the learnings of these four months of lockdown is the communication between GO and NGO, state and non-state actor is very important. Dialogue has to continue. I think the countries in which there is a comp no freedom of expression, they have suffered the most. We don't even have what is happening, whether it's a good news, bad news, horrifying news. But I think once you know that these things are happening at a ground level, you can also find the ways of reaching out. Uh, the use of the technology, especially the uh, 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 social media, uh, is, has played a very, very important role in capturing the visual memories of what was what, what happening. Uh, and that uh, informed the relief and the resources that needed to be generated. And the evidence-based appropriate policy that is a need of an hour. For the first time, Niti Aayog CEO has admired the work of NGOs. The first time, like with the NGOs, criminalization of NGOs that was happening over the last 10 years, I think that has gone away. And there is appreciation by the government organizations that NGOs have been the major uh, frontline uh, workers, corona warriors, and they also, corona phobia, uh, they, they had transcended corona phobia. So, uh, uh, so government uh, relief package is declared is considered as an economic package by the social organizations. Gender blindness of uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan and Garib Kalyan Yojana has been discussed in great detail with the meticulous uh, uh, details of the kind of language which is used in that women are completely invisible and uh, social movement also calls it a jumla. The priority areas in Atmanirbhar Bharat Yudna with the tra targeting MSMEs, uh, only one state has said that in the rejuvenation period uh, uh, in a post-COVID-19 uh, lockdown, uh, they would proactively include women in the workforce. That is only Kerala has said that. Dr. Mridhu Lippan, who is in the planning state planning board of uh, Kerala government, has said that none of the other governments even has talked about, they, have, they see women only as a worker's wife. If they are talking about migrant workers, it's the migrant uh, worker's wife or a worker's mother or a worker's daughter. But women as workers, that has not been or even there in the, uh, in the worldview of the, those who have come up with this Atmanirva uh, Bharat Yubhyan or Garib Kalyan Yojana. Uh, even when it comes to agricultural infrastructure, there is a great possibility of inducting educated 12th past 10th past girls into the new uh, infrastructure that is being created and the food processing industry is going to gain major uh, attention as per the Ministry of Industry because we had a bumper crop and we have a, that's the only sector which has a positive growth rate under the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Coal mining, has not, uh, uh, there is nothing about gender. Defense manufacturing has nothing to do with gender. Main thing is MG Narega, where the allocation has increased up to uh, 1 lakh crore. For 60 lakh crore was there by the latest budget, 2020-21, and 40 crore, uh, 40 lakh, uh, 40,000 crore under Atmanirbhar Bharat Yojana. So the most important thing is a skill mapping, and after short-term courses of employment uh, to run the daycare, uh, centers for children or community kitchen, elderly care center, shelter home, maintenance and management of quarantine center, detection uh, centers, public health centers, food processing centers, horticulture, poultry, cottage, and craft-based industries. I think the vision of including women in, and girls into uh, uh, this because the labor def definition of labor force in our country is 15 to 59. 
So I think we, there has to be very careful uh, planning about uh, including, uh, involving them and uh, increasing their participation in the workforce. Uh, MG Narega rate, which is declared as 370 on paper, but actually all these studies, uh, assess, uh, rapid assessment studies of the uh, trade unions and uh, peasant organizations are showing that actually they are getting 230 rupees and women workers are getting only 120 rupees. So even when the state is employer, you see this discrimination increase. Yeah, uh, this is the last one. Yeah, I'm coming to the end of it. How many minutes do I have? Uh, five more minutes. Yes, yeah, I'll be able to finish. Yes. So this is the uh, the another bone of contention is public health expenditure, which comes to less than two percent. There is a demand of six percent. Even WHO has suggested ten percent of the allocation. Because uh, and a major concerns of the women's organizations have been delivery of reproductive health services. Uh, also, uh, curfew passes to family members of pregnant women, balanced diet, and so uh, starting of ICDS center as an essential service, uh, make provision of 90 days of wages to all pregnant women for, in the third trimester and women who have less than six months of uh, children with less than six months of age. Services for women helpline, short stay home and child helpline need to be kept fully functional and also they should be classified as essential services. Uh, directory for support services of stranded students, women headed households, persons with disability and transgender community is not difficult to make in today's time of information technology and uh, most of them even have other also. So combating increasing child marriages and gender based violence is very important. And water and sanitation is very important. There is a demand by the trade union organizations and the women working with the informal sector, women's groups like SEVA, that there should be a dedicated labor helpline accessible in several uh, languages. Uh, and this helpline should not give only data about in migration, out migration, but all it should go beyond relief measures and provide reliable information on the policy announcements at the state and central level, uh, addressing wage denial, layoffs, termination, workplace discrimination police brutality and sudden uh, uh, forceful eviction from their home or their factory. So, so reduction in social inequality is a major concern when it comes to uh, uh, gender sensitivity and gender responsiveness. Uh, so gender ex combating gender exclusion, ensure gender justice and equity and dignity, uh, encourage the equitable sharing of domestic tasks that I think the media, uh, uh, government media also has to um, make a very proactive effort if the domestic task is not only the job of only women and girls. Ensure increased access to sanitation and emergency shelter space is also for unhoused people is very important. Implement protocol and train authorities on recognizing and engaging vulnerable populations, particularly when the new laws are being posed. Every week, every day, new advisories and laws are coming. People, police is just using the brute force. I think that is not the way to go about. Consultations of the government bodies with civil society organizations are a must for implementing legislation and policy and for guaranteeing equal access to information, public health education and resources in multiple languages and universal demand. Even those who were earlier talking about neoliberal logic of market as a leveler, they are also now talking about the uh, strengthening the demand side by expanding fiscal uh, fiscal expansion and minimum uh, the, the 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 minimum wages uh, to be implemented and also the cash transfer uh, and giving cash in the hand of people to increase uh, 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 purchasing power is very important. Uh, six percent uh, education uh, GDP of the GDP for the education sector, especially when the online education, all the movers and shakers of the new education policy are talking about 30% online teach, uh, teaching, 20% face-to-face, -face, and 50% reality, the skill-oriented courses. That is the formula they are adopting. So even in this uh, context, educational infrastructure needs to uh, upgrade itself, especially the public education for the student from uh, marginalized section. And along with the human rights organizations, the state needs to adopt human rights oriented protocols with regard to people in prison, administrative migration center, quarantine center, confinement camps, people with disabilities in institutions and psychiatric facilities who are at a higher risk of COVID-19 contingent due to confinement conditions. These are the, some of the references based on the studies done during the period of lockdown from March to August. The latest issue of EPW also has a several features and articles on yeah, COVID on the subject. 
Thank you very much, Professor Vimuthi Patel, for very extremely comprehensive review, uh, both in terms of what has been happening, in terms of uh, laying down very detailed overview uh, of, of the problem, and uh, what needs to be done, that also has to be uh, addressed. And we will take up more of these questions because some questions have come up. So later. Right now, I will request the panelists to probably have three to four minutes uh, addressing the question so we can, uh, 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 the panelists mean discussant. And uh, so, um, uh, so that uh, if we have less time, then probably we can have more questions from the audience because people have been writing. So Dr. Simi Mehta, can you introduce the Professor Samapti Guha and uh, other uh, other discussants? Yes, I, I can also introduce. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to uh, share some remarks or after the discussants? Uh, no, after the discussion. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I forgot that. Okay. Yes, uh, so let me thank you and congratulate uh, Professor uh, uh, Patel for uh, highlighting all the issues. And it was more like uh, also listening into the state of affairs, <clears throat> not just the gender implication. Ma'am has touched so many things from policies. Uh, in fact, starting from the policies and what the state of affairs has been, uh, uh, and especially looking into Atmanirbhar Bharat, and then Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana, also looking into the gender dimensions into the packages, uh, 1 lakh 70 thousand crore, and then subsequently 21 lakh crore, and also touching upon the new newly announced agricultural infrastructure fund. And ma'am has uh, uh, highlighted many human rights issues, and uh, uh, one very, uh, uh, I would say, dynamic and vibrant suggestion or the question ma'am is posing, that where are the Fortune 500 companies? Uh, where are the management skills? Uh, where are the project monitoring units and uh, and uh, so on and so forth especially in 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 this time of pandemic uh, thank you so much ma'am and once again uh, uh, we are so grateful to listen to such an elaborate presentation which you have given us uh, without uh, wasting I would suggest, uh, professor patel's uh, task is not yet over there are people some raising questions for speaking so much i really wanted uh, to ease down. Uh, very quickly, let me introduce first a uh, discussion for, for today's lecture. Uh, Professor Sampati Guha. Ma'am, can you, uh, are you there? Yes. Yes, Samapti Guha. I'm yes. Samapti Guha. <laughs> Ma'am, let me, let me quickly introduce you. Uh, Professor Sampati uh, uh, Guha is chairperson, Center for Social Entrepreneurship, School of Management and Labor Studies at uh, TIS Mumbai. Uh, Ma'am, over to you. Yeah, what can we have three to four minutes, please? Uh, because we want to give more time for the. I know. Okay, uh, so uh, Professor Patel already, you know, gave a very uh, holistic view of uh, the gender dimension, uh, and and my uh, area of work uh, is on. Um, uh, women uh, micro entrepreneurship and my micro enterprises. So I will uh, talk uh, specifically talk about the Atanivar scheme and and uh, what is uh, uh, going to happen uh, with the women micro entrepreneur. So if we look at um, you know whole India MSME sector, uh, you can see that only 9.09 .09 percent of the uh, micro enterprises are led by women. And uh, when we would talk about the Atonirvar scheme and uh, their uh, lot of issues. Uh, the first of all, if you look at the characteristics of the women led micro enterprises, they are really, really in terms of the size, really micro, sometimes it is also nano size. And uh, secondly, that um, when they are operating, uh, you know, they have uh, the, the, their kind of enterprises are of survival type. It's not opportunity driven. And uh, when it is survival type, that means they have very lack of access to any form of resources, whether it is a finance or the even social capital, because, uh, you know, women led micro enterprises have double bar burden, burden in the sense that one is the financial burden every micro enterprises are facing, but due to the patriarchal pressure 
on them you know they they are not able to uh, most of the time go out of the home so home based micro enterprises are very relevant feature in case of the women micro entrepreneurs and because uh, they are under the patriarchal influences they might not have the uh, most of the time you know role model or the social capital which they can build outside of their family friend and the neighborhood so that's also sometimes uh, and it it increases the problem during the pandemic from the both the side from the supply side one is that they don't have the access to resources and they don't know where to what are the alternative sources where they can acquire those resources secondly uh, they also have a financial burden but uh, if you look at the atanirva scheme uh, most of these micro enterprises are not registered they don't have the credit history so uh, the major facilities under the atanirva scheme they might not in a position to to access those facilities and when they are not able to access those facilities major part of the schemes are not applicable to them so in such a pandemic earlier you know there are little bit microfinance or they are going they are connected to their vendors or or suppliers where they used to borrow and run but due to this physical distancing or the lockdown you know those known resources are not also available because there are the other suppliers are also facing lot of problems in the market right so supply side issue also many folded from the demand side there are several job loss in case of the uh, women led micro enterprises because the demand for those goods are not uh, in the market it is an abnormal time and uh, the, the newly required uh, you know demand they are not able to cater to because they don't have that skill and that's why last part of the professor patel's uh, uh, you know address uh, we saw that uh, there should be a you know skill training and uh, not only for the wage employment but also for the self employment now there are huge demand in the health sector or the paramedical sector but these uh, women led micro enterprises they don't have the skill they don't have the knowledge and nobody they don't know where to approach to acquire those knowledges so so it is a double burden to the, them because one side uh, they are suffering with their existing uh, business and they are not able to diversify for many reasons okay so skill um, finance um, also uh, they, they, their network is so poor that they cannot diversify their business also and there is a sheer you know uh, the, the the way they started their enterprise to survive in the society for their familial help but now it's such a, a situation that they are uh, you know uh, getting so much burden indebtedness is also very rising and uh, it is a, another fold of i think poverty is um, affecting uh, them in a different way i think i finish my four minutes thank you thank you thank you for highlighting at the moment Professor Kelkar, yes, your voice is breaking. Uh, I wanted to request you to introduce uh, uh, Ms. Urvashi Prasad. Is she there? Yes, yes, Urvashi, ma'am, is here, ma'am. I would uh, uh, give up my comments on everybody because of the time constraint. I am keeping it uh, my voice reserved as such. That's why, including Professor. Vibhuti Patel, I did not sum up because I thought that I would save some time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Urvashi, ma'am, is a public policy specialist, office of the vice chairman, uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar at Niti Aayog. Uh, Urvashi, ma'am, over to you. Uh, thank you. I hope I'm audible. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll just make uh, you know four very quick points uh, from the policy um, perspective. I think the lecture was uh, fantastic, and it's you know highlighted that we have so many uh, you know plethora of existing challenges when it comes to women, and these really get exacerbated uh, when we are faced with a crisis you know like a pandemic. So I think I'll make four quick points here. One is on data. 
and and this is something that you know we've been trying to advocate for very strongly within the system as well that we really need a dedicated unit uh, which collects which frequently puts out um, metrics which concern women because you know if you see the case of covid uh, this is something that we are constantly talking about we're constantly putting out data in the public domain and you see that it always remains top of mind uh, in fact we have had actually much bigger epidemics in this country we have them on a daily basis let's look at tuberculosis for instance but simply because we are not every day putting out data every day highlighting the challenges um, they don't quite get the attention you know that's something that to talk about on a daily basis gets so frankly we need good quality periodically collected data which is put out on a regular basis and we've been suggesting that we need a dedicated gender monitoring unit within the ministry uh, within the women and child development uh, departments at the state level which can actually do this because gender is multifaceted I mean, gender is about health about education about labor force participation about attitudes towards women and their agency uh, so this is something that i think really needs to be a priority from a policy perspective because you know as we say what gets measured gets done uh, and if we are not measuring enough if we are not talking about it enough it's unlikely that those challenges will uh, get addressed as well the second is on our laws uh, you know legislations i think we're a very legislation heavy country we have lots of legislations we have a lot of policies where we falter is the implementation and that is where we need to really focus on capacity building uh, on being able to really train the personnel that we have whether it's in the police whether it is social workers uh, to be able to perform the roles that we expect of them you know let us look at new types of crimes that are coming up the cyber crimes a lot of which affect women disproportionately and we might have large sections of our uh, you know police or other types of sort of frontline workforce who are not even aware of how do we deal with these types of crimes so we need a lot of capacity building sensitization and not just you know going on creating new laws and policies that get suboptimally uh, implemented the third is on attitudes and i think we definitely need and i think this is something dr patel also touched about uh, touched upon that we need large uh, sort of you know behavior change uh, campaigns the government needs to do these in partnership obviously with civil society organizations uh, which have a very wide reach and a very diverse reach because attitudes affect women in different ways whether it is caregiving which is primarily still considered you know a woman's role um, making it very difficult for women to actually often participate in the formal uh, workforce or whether it is women hesitating to come out and speak about you know violence that they might be facing within their homes uh, for the fear of getting socially isolated or even isolated by their own families so these are really attitudinal issues which we need to address uh, through some you know very large campaigns but also tailored campaigns which can really reach to people in the language that they understand in the context they relate to and finally um, i would say that uh, we've seen in the pandemic or you know in, in the case of covid specifically there are huge interlinkages uh, between gender and public health you know whether it is issues faced by our frontline workers whether it is abuse faced by nurses in hospitals whether it is female patients in covid care centers feeling uh, you know sort of uncomfortable or having to deal with any kind of sexual harassment or whether it is stigma we've seen that stigma affects women disproportionately often whether it's tuberculosis whether it's in mental health so these these are huge interlinkages between public health and gender so we really need to create a focal point which can actually uh, you know work on this in a comprehensive fashion otherwise what happens within the government is you know people keep saying this is not my domain or this is not you know my area of work and it falls under a different ministry or a different department so we've been constantly advocating for a focal point which can actually bring together uh, some of these implement uh, you know issues and address them in a cohesive manner and sort of create a, a template for future you know um dr patel has pointed out so many learnings that we've had from this epidemic and we don't need to keep reinventing the wheel there should be a way of documenting this of institutionalizing these memories within the system so that the next time we are faced with a crisis like this we almost have a sort of set of standard operating procedures to at least begin with uh, so i think these are the four points that uh, you know i would highlight uh, from a policy perspective thank you Great. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Shah. That's really, I mean, one of the things that, uh, from Niti Aayog's point of view and from your point of view, you are really stressing the change in attitudes, which is a new area 
and without change in attitudes, I mean, it is very kind of difficult to achieve anything. Thank you. Uh, Arjun, uh, Next speaker, shall I? Balwant uh, Mehta. Professor I.C. Avasthi. Oh, I'm sorry. Good. Okay, Balwant sir, you can come. Are, are you ready? Okay, yes, yes, fine, fine, yes. Uh, okay, let me introduce uh, uh, Professor Mehta. Sir, your camera is off. Yes, sir. yes, yes. Let me introduce you, but also summarize uh, what uh, uh, Urvashi ma'am has uh, has highlighted. One very important thing, which uh, again, I'd like to congratulate Professor Patel uh, for highlighting so many issues from data. She has compiled from almost all the sources what the data is saying, and rightly, the ministry is uh, 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 trying to establish an integrated database because unless we do not have blood test, urine test, what kind of prescription or analysis uh, any consultation will give. So even for this gender issue, uh, these things are of a very primary level. And uh, there are many points. I'm, I'm sure a chair will take all these issues at last. Uh, and uh, let me introduce Professor Balwan Singh Mehta, our next discussion. Uh, Professor Mehta is research director at IMPRI and also senior fellow uh, at uh, Center for Ec Economic Development at Institute for Human Development. Uh, over to you, Professor Mehta, that is joining from the community. Uh, shall I start, Arjun? Yes, please. Yes, please sir. go ahead. Shall I start? Please okay, go ahead. Okay, fine. Thank, you. Thank you, Arjun, and um, uh, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, this is really a, a very uh, detailed uh, you know, lecture I think uh, covering all uh, aspects from economic uh, health to domestic uh, care activities to uh, domestic violence, like uh, the violence issues. So apart from this, this uh, there, are, there are other issues she has covered very nicely. And uh, I really I also congratulate her for this detailed presentation covering all aspects. Uh, I'll just, uh, because of lack of time, I'm just uh, just covering two uh, two uh, things which I'm uh, which I, I'm working for the last few, you know, uh, uh, few uh, Yes, one is uh, one is the issue is uh, the child labor. Uh, another one is uh, you know the work from home or you know the future of work. So these are the two issues which has uh, come up uh, pretty prominently during this pandemic. One is uh, the child uh, child labor, it's particularly when you talk about you know the job losses uh, because of this informality of uh, you know uh, the jobs, very dominant kind of informality of jobs in Indian labor market, particularly the women. Uh, who uh, have lost more than men uh, what the or rapid survey so so this clearly highlighted you know how vulnerable they, they, the, these families are when we talk about you know uh, their their survival so what exactly happens when when you know you, you, even in the past we, we have experienced during Ebola, during economic crisis in 2000 uh, uh, you know nine and Asian crisis in 2000 uh, 1997 so during that uh, the child labor spike, and another the other aspect is like the, particularly the girls who uh, who uh, you know uh, the the study shows like uh, you know particularly the the trafficking, uh, child labor, child marriage, and a lot of other issues has come up, uh, and even the drop out of the schools, which I think uh, uh, the Patel also highlighted some of the issues, which the UNESCO also said like 86 percent of the schools in India don't have uh, this digital connectivity. How can you think about more? So what happens when you know if a lot of children dropped out from the school, they don't go. The, the, the past uh, uh, studies and experiences of the school, they don't. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, then again reconnect them to the schools. So so this is the situation which we have to think a lot. Okay, these are the issues which we have to think how to how to take care of those children who have uh, whose uh, you know guardian or you know uh, the parents or, or mothers uh, have lost uh, their jobs or. Or died due to pandemic, so 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 they are opposed to these kind of things, and and so that is what one of the issue, one of the challenge, which which I think we needs uh, which, which needs highlighted and which which uh, the serious uh, actions should be taken. And the other another one is obviously there are a lot of challenges that we are facing today due to pandemic, but there are also opportunities, new opportunities which uh, which uh, it is creating. That is uh, that is uh, what, what we say future of work is work from home. Uh, obviously, uh, it uh, leads to some kind of you know. Uh, extra burden to women, what the study shows, but uh, but in the coming days when uh, this post pandemic, so this will create a new job opportunities for women because this uh, uh, form of this, this so-called gig economy, 
which you now uh, people say it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a gig economy, which is emerging uh, all over the world because of this pandemic. This, uh, this is a new kind of thing, which is, I think, it's a new normal, we can say, it's, it's going to become. So, but the problem of this uh, uh, this new normal of work from home is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the no norms, no regulation, and even uh, those those who work from, uh, like, Obviously, uh, those who are employed with the uh, with the organization, some kind of, but but that is all right. But after the you know pandemic, most of uh, them have this kind of opportunity. Those who are highly skilled, but those who are less skilled, they need some kind of you know uh, uh, included in the labor laws or some kind of you know decent work they require. So these are the two things which I I would like to highlight, and I think uh, these are the very much you know during the pandemic, these are the uh, these are the critical issues which needs policy. Uh, yeah, you know, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Balban Preta. I think it is very, very important, and uh, particularly attention to girl has come up. Uh, can we invite now Professor Awasti? Uh, Hello. Hello. Uh, well, uh, uh, so let me introduce you, uh, Professor Awasti. Your video is off. Okay. Kelka ma'am, your voice is coming very low. I don't know why. Very low voice, Professor Kelkar. I'll, I'll take it. Now it is better. Now it is better. Okay. Professor Avasti? Yes, sir. Let me introduce, sir, your camera is still off. Okay. okay. Let me introduce Professor Ishwar Chand Avasti. Uh, Professor Ishwar Chand Avasti is professor uh, at the Institute for Human Development and uh, also uh, honorary secretary of Indian Society. Okay. Indian Society for Labor Economics, ISLE, and Indian Association for Social Science Institution, IASI, uh, 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 and very, very prestigious organization and uh, almost uh, 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 aligned with India's economic development. Professor Avasti, over to you. Sir is joining us from Noida. Okay. Uh, lecture covered a wide spectrum of issues and stimulated a good understanding and uh, uh, learning on gender implication of uh, pandemic. There are huge, huge challenges for women's work in terms of uh, gender segregation in the labor market, wage disparities, unemployment among youth, uh, women, uh, patriarchy-based societies, and various factors that inhibit women to seek employment outside limited segment of the market. While male-female uh, gaps in educational attainments have uh, narrowed down considerably, Gaps in labor force participation rate has widened. Female LFPR, LFPR during the last 15 years or so has, uh, has, has declined continuously. A women suffered more than men, and particularly uh, women among uh, socially disadvantaged groups, uh, civil castes, civil tribes, uh, and others. Now, this unprecedented uh, pandemic has resulted in massive erosion of jobs, livelihoods. Uh, economies who, which are depending upon informal sectors, uh, they are the first victim of uh, upheaval in terms of various economic activities. Uh, it was estimated that 91 million jobs have lost during uh, uh, April, May uh, uh, 2020. And a large part of uh, uh, jobs were lost in the informal sector. Almost one third employment consists of women of total informal economy. And women are are, are engaged in a variety of works like petty trading, uh, small manufacturing activities, and uh, and uh, many women work performing peace work from their homes. And they, this is a hidden form of employment and uh, who are most vulnerable to job losses. Now, women are more likely to, uh, to, to, to be vulnerable to losing jobs than men, uh, and uh, more particularly uh, among civil castes, civil tribes, and other disciplines, sections of societies. Women are also suffering from domestic violence in the pandemic, uh, pandemic uh, uh, period, and they face a, a double whammy, uh, losing jobs as well as facing various kinds of violence. Now, question of creating employment is a very complex and sordid process. Uh, we have to look uh, both these things from demand supply side. Demand side uh, interventions typically include credit training, technology, markets, and so forth. While uh, demand side uh, interventions include a very positive macroeconomic policy environment that really motivates employment, creates more employment. Now, uh, 
uh, various kinds of uh, policies, measures, in terms of strategies, in terms of action point sensitive in this lecture by uh, scholar uh, Vibhuti Patel has a direct policy implications. And certainly policy uh, planners have, they have to learn uh, to, 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 to focus on action uh, 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 more actively and uh, as soon as possible this should be done. Uh, with this, I'll uh, stop my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Avasti, so much, and keeping in time in mind that is a, agreeing with both with the many kind of aspects of what we are talking about: job losses, hidden form of employment, and other things. So uh, I would request now uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar to invite Dr. Indu Prakash Singh, mm. a legend in our analysis. <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Singh. That's sir, your it. mic is off. Indu, sir. <laughs> yes. well, Indu, sir, is our advisor at Impact and Policy Research Institute. And Indu, sir, has many feathers in his cap. Uh, sir, is also uh, uh, with City Makers International, an organization which focuses uh, uh, on the homelessness is issues, not just in Indian cities and Indian villages, but across the world. Sir, has represented in uh, many UN meetings and many meetings for these uh, for human rights issues of the marginalized section of society. Sir is involved in 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 Delhi government's committee uh, for welfare during the pandemic, and uh, uh, it will take a lot of time. Doctor Singh, over to you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. First of all, you know uh, I have two doyens of the women's movement, uh, Govind Kelkarji and Vibhuti. They are dear friends from whom we have learned so much. So, and uh, so I think, uh, you know, uh, I must just say that I'm uh, privileged to be uh, in a session where both of you are there. And uh, I, I surely agree with what uh, Professor Govind Kelkar said that, um, you know, in the Asian countries that uh, the maxim that we follow is that do nothing at all, do nothing about it. Um, and uh, I think Vibhuti, your, um, I think, uh, address was just superlative. I think you have, I, I, I must say that you have not actually left anything untouched, you know. It's a very comprehensive, very holistic, and you have gone in depth uh, about um, the entire issue as such. So, you know, uh, one can uh, keep talking about, but I, I think, you know, I will not get into what you spoke because all that you spoke was valid. Maybe I'll talk about uh, certain issues from being part of the Delhi government's um, uh, advisory panel on COVID relief as to what work we did and how it happened and all that. Plus, I would talk about certain impressions that I have about um, what has worked and what has not worked. Uh, and maybe that's because it's a personal information. So I think I'd like to give it to everybody here. Uh, one was that I think, you know, when we were made, um, uh, you know, uh, before the COVID um, lockdown came in, uh, we as a group were battling with Delhi riots. And uh, we were um, supporting the Northeast Delhi as such. Uh, with groups and um, so Delhi government and we were working together in providing relief to the right victims uh, because it, it had happened very soon, you know, very, very early in February itself it had happened. And uh, then the COVID lockdown came in and uh, then the government put in the advisory panel, we were there in that. And I must tell that, you know, um, for us, um, uh, right from, see, I think, um, and uh, I think you mentioned the six states which did very well which was Kerala, Maharashtra, Delhi, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Jharkhand. Uh, actually, these are also non-BJP states. Sir. So it also goes, it also talks about, um, I think, the governance structures in the states as such, you know, because they were more pro-people, more proactive, and open to civil society interventions. So um, for us, you know, um, uh, like in Delhi, uh, even before the lockdown, the food was being um, you know, given to uh, the homeless in all the shelters of Delhi, over 200 shelters we have. The food started from about say, um, you know, 28th to 21st of um, uh, February as such, you know, uh, in, in Delhi as such, uh, March, March, sorry. And uh, then as uh, the lockdown happened, uh, the homeless shelters were made the feeding points for uh, neighboring areas, you know, the slums and all, so that there was no uh, chaos as such. And then the schools opened up as uh, feeding centers. And then, of course, the PDS came in, then uh, ration distribution to the people who didn't have uh, cards and who didn't have ration cards and all, they came in. So 
for every bit i think you know i must tell you that this two three months that we had you know right from march actually february i would say the right time till covid and all i think three four months you know was actually 24 7 work for many of us you know so uh, like despite the fact that we were not supposed to visit we visited certain places certain shelters we visited school shelters and all that and um, you know uh, could uh, contribute a, a, as such but there were a lot of um, problems also with the bureaucracy because bureaucracy is not attuned to working with civil society in a way but thankfully since the delhi government was attuned to uh, for, you know working with us so i think we were able to still manage to do a couple of things what i want to you know uh, also say here is that i think uh, vibhuti you did mention that you know uh, the 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 union government um, or the approach of many other governments was at times to criminalize the ngos and all that and maybe now it's a bit got diluted because of the approach has really happened has, has taken place i personally feel that well um, you know uh, uh, while this these six governments that is mentioned about the other governments also working i personally feel you know in this entire thing you know about um, uh, how the covid impacted the women it became worse because the union government was totally silent on that their actions were not taking on the ground at all and i am very upfront that i, I see no reason why a pm's relief fund was made into pm cares why in delhi while the covid work was on we were getting people uh, arrested on rights work as such you know people the activists were getting arrested on rights cases there was javnia investigation happening and many of my own people in the uh, covid relief were being called by the cbi and all these people as the sit in all for investigations and one thing i want to say here is that uh, it was you know during this huge inf- you know um, uh, migrants you know return to villages and all when people were walking in the streets i remember uh, since justice kalash gambhir is also a friend he supported us in supreme court case so uh, you know i just i, I told sir I, i told justice kalash gambhir that sir as a judge of the high court why don't you write to supreme court justices to intervene in this matter he said you know uh, you know so whatever he said i think is different matter but luckily he wrote to the chief justice of supreme court there were senior advocates who wrote to the supreme court judges and we had the supreme court intervening asking government as to what to do but the intervention was very late and actually if you see that was the time when also prashant tweeted and all you know and which has become major uh, you know defamation case and all that what's going on my simple question is like while the civil society was all active about it was doing it and you have spoken uh, you have uh, you know highlighted that very well vibhuti you highlighted the entire gamut of it my only um, you know thing is that i think um, my only regret is that the union government was absconding they were busy about laying foundation stone in ayodhya they were busy compromising the issues as such so somewhere i think for many of us our work became tough because we were working only with the local governments and somewhere the biggest stumbling block was the union government and the domestic violence cases and all those things uh people are petrified to go to the police whether it was up and all uh, vibhuti you know i had set up this we a whatsapp group in which we got started getting calls from different places as such and thankfully since we had some you know high uh, friends in the bureaucracy in up and all we were able to intervene but then this is that is a not not no right approach when we have got the national commission for women we have got the state commission of women we have got so many state bodies and you know legislative bodies and all those things what were they doing why were they absent the issue is that women are suffering and mass children are suffering like in delhi many slums you know we had food and all going but many kids went without milk young kids you know under 6 and that's when the dcpcr and center for education research akhilas organization all got together and went about distributing food in slums and all now this should have been a mandate of the government and so somewhere i think i can surely say here coming from suzari not that i'm going to you know uh, just brag about our role but i want to honestly tell you that this is something which i feel that uh, country wide the civil society played a stellar role and much of the you know uh, odds that were laid out got a bit reduced because of the role that civil society played as such we might be demonized we might be called names we might be scrutinized by the government but somewhere 
had not the society come into action, I think the situation would be much, much grim. And uh, thank you for recognizing the work and thank you Imprit, for giving this opportunity to talk about it. I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Indu Prakash Singh. You have not lost your smile as we have not lost. And uh, there was something missing really uh, about uh, putting the kind of no action on the part of the government, which you have very clearly pointed out. Because living in Delhi, this is a stark reality. Pinda Todo, activists are being uh, imprisoned and repeatedly charges are laid. And we, as we talk of women's freedom and women's rights, we cannot forget that that how what is happening. Thank you. I would uh, not take time at this point. Can we, uh, Arjun? Can we invite, please, Ms. Maitri Handik? Yes, Maitri. Yes, Maitri. Let me. Yeah. But also to uh, come back from uh, what Indu sir said. Indu sir is also advisor at Center for Advocacy and Research CIFAR. I I told I, I told that I won't be able to cover everything for Indu sir. Sir has raised. Uh, uh, but I really wanted to ask, sir, where is your Betty Bachao, that batch? Priyanka, ma'am, always keep it. That is missing. I am not seeing for a few days. I'm, I'm wearing a t shirt. Sir. I'm wearing a t shirt. So I can't wear that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The, okay. the t shirt is come off. <laughs> okay. And, sir, a very pertinent point on effectiveness of our institution, of the all the bodies, a National Commission for Women, State Commission for Women, and what CSO uh, in action doing. Uh, thank you for having civil society perspective. Now moving to uh, uh, Handik, ma'am, we have a, a journalist point of view. Uh, uh, Ms. Maitre Handik has been with many media houses from last two, three decades. And ma'am is a senior fellow at uh, our institute, IMPRI. And without wasting any time, ma'am, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Arjun. Actually, most of the speakers, particularly Mr. Singh, has already touched upon all the critical issues that I wanted to speak about gender parity. So I'll be brief, uh, summing up what uh, everybody has said. There is actually a lot of gender data available in India, you know, today than it was 10 years ago. The time now is actually to come together, measure and consolidate this data to improve long-term health and economic prospects of women. Data is critical for any planning. And coming to that and coming to COVID, I noticed that there is no attempt yet, either by the central or the state governments to provide gender-wise information on those who have been affected by COVID. And there is also very little has been reported in media about this. But this kind of information is really, really critical because at present, as we see that the entire health machinery of the country is gearing to tackle the COVID epidemic. But at the same time, we cannot sideline, you know, women, um, women's health issues and, you know, other interventions like polio vaccinations or immunization. We know from news reports how health crisis like Ebola has affected maternal health in many countries. And I think um, Mrs. Patel has already pointed that out. And besides this, there is a dramatic decrease in economic activity at present. In conventional terms, men are seen to be affected more by the pandemic than women. However, we all know that employment do not fall equally for both men and women. Women are the first to lose their jobs anytime and there is a economic recession women also get paid less as we know. So as we speak, thousands of women in our country are gearing up for the rice plantation, for example, and which is largely seen as a women's activity. But even here, if men were to do the same job and has the same skill and works for the same number of hours, they still earn about 50 to rupees 100 less than men. While the current economic scenario is pretty bad right now, the government has again gone ahead to dilute the labor laws. And in this recent announcement, I have not seen anything of value to the women's workforce or even any decisions on gender wage parity. Anyway, the government has announced a host of initiatives, not just on labor laws, but on many issues, which to my mind is detrimental to women's concerns and spirit of democratic governance as a whole. And our prime minister has spoken on welfare, women's welfare during his speeches, but we are waiting to hear a truly sensitive plan on what he exactly has on this um, 
you know, has on this mind. We have to recognize that legislative provisions are crucial for women empowerment. And I think we need more legislations actually, uh, more you know, focused uh, legislations, which I think I will disagree with Prasad, Ms. Prasad here. Um, a few days ago, you know, at a webinar organized by IMPRI, one of the speakers had clearly illustrated on why Panchayati Raj is working in some states and not in other states, and how states that have included women's participations in rural and urban local bodies have fared better in tackling the COVID pandemic. So IMPRI has actually organized several webinars on women, which I've attended. And I'm certain that if we collect these thoughts and if we can build a good, we can build a good plan, you know, for women in the future. Thank you, over to you, Arjun. I'll just keep it short. I think most of it has been said here. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for being brief. Uh, I think over to Chair now for her quick comments, and then we can go to uh, Professor Patel. Kelkar, ma'am, how do we? The... I don't know how to sum up really uh, Professor Bebuti Patel's kind of brilliant, comprehensive data analysis, uh, in-depth knowledge, very comprehensive kind of facts and figures, uh, and constructive critique of the policies, including that. That would be the, she combines the knowledge, feeling and commitment that comes from women's movement and from the studies. We need two things in order to understand the process. We need knowledge and we need really, uh, along with the commitment, we need part of the movement, whether it is a mass movement or people's movement or women's movement, that is, that is important. And when such a kind of uh, outpour comes out, you can see that there is a passion and there is a knowledge. And that's how Bibhuti Patel uh, presentation included today. Now that is true. That is uh, now there had been some kind of uh, questions that um, uh, that we should have been more forthright in critiquing the state and critiquing the policy. Why, which has come really uh, that has been complemented by Maitri and uh, complemented by Indu Prakash Singh. So that is the one thing and that we need to do this. So overall, it has been wonder, wonderful session and learning a great deal. So I, we have, in terms of the time, we are running short of time. So I don't know how to really compliment fully Vibhuti Patel, but Vibhuti, you understand that our common goal, which we have been there struggle. And now that a lot of people have appreciated and they want to have the kind of share, uh, kind of, uh, request is to share your presentation uh, with them. So I hope Pimpri will do that. Now the, there are questions raised by them and as a part of my duty as a chair to kind of not take each and each, each question, but some of them, and there are three kind of questions that have come up and they need to be addressed by Professor Patel. One is really the, what do we do in future? I mean, you have touched that, that future we need to do that. But most of these things we have been doing for years, for decades, uh, gender budget, this and that. And it has not solved the question of gender disparity. It has not solved the question of women's inequality, which has become worse in COVID. It is not that women inequality and discrimination against happen and violence against ha women, ha women happen only in COVID. It has been there. It got much worse in the COVID period. That is the one acknowledge. And same way, if we need the diagnosis, then we need to look at the background and we need to really look at the what would be the new normal in terms of addressing those questions. So that is one thing. So that is what one kind of question is coming. Okay, what do we do in future? All this came in media, which you have summed up very well, but future, future we want, what would be the effective? It would be legislation, it would be implementation, it would be attitudes, or it would be various other things that would be uh, including these. Second question that comes is about the gender sensitization. That you have not spoken, we have not spoken about gender sensitization. And there is a question, some kind of being raised, that are we 
feeling fatigued with gender sensitization? I think uh, uh, you need to answer this, but I feel that when you talk of the attitudes, this is the gender sensitization. General gender sensitization has not worked. What has really the now be the real change if we look at the new kind of uh, new uh, new parameters of analysis, then we want whether there has been a change in gender relations. That it would be important. Whether there has been a kind of uh, change in terms of resource allocation to women, uh, whether there has been change in the safety of women that we can walk as freely uh, in Delhi roads or Bombay roads uh, as uh, any any human being walks. So that would be the kind of result that we will see, the indicators. The, I was struggling to find what would be our indicators for the future. And third question comes uh, about the, somebody has raised the important question that quantitative data, questioning the data, that on the one hand we say that there is no data for women, so that's why limited action can be there. There is no data on real poverty. There is no data on, was not really data on migrants. But look at what happened and how, now we are not waiting for data. Action needs to be taken. I mean, because this is the reality. So whether the quantitative data and it is a kind of, and it related complexity, people trust in that data. Somehow people are losing, researchers are losing faith in the data that is being produced. That also we need to address. So these are the three questions that have come up from the audience. And can I request uh, Bibhuti please to address them? Ma'am, Mike, ma'am, you, you have to unmute. Thank the you. first, yeah, first question is that what do we do about the future? So I think in last five months uh, for in India and globally, I think last seven months, a uh, lot of new whatever the initiative, civil society organizations and the uh, NGOs and women's groups have taken. So many new things have emerged. So first of all, we'll have to build the pressure the way Indu Prakash talked about the, what are the gaps in the in the state intervention or what is happening. So pressure has to be, go on, whether it is from SHG or Panchayati Raj institutions, which had done well in so many states or trade unions, because we saw that when they, the 12 states said that they would just abolish all the labor laws, all 48 labor laws and 200 state laws will go away. And for coming, some states say that for three years, three months, Gujarat said for three years, it was immediately all trade unionists, they, they, trade union organizations came together, they approached ILO, ILO contacted PMO office. And for the first time in last five months, we realized that we have a labor minister. And Labor Minister also gave interview in Indian Express. And he said, no, 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 we are not going to do away with Thirdi. So I think uh, national level, uh, regional level, and international pressure, that is very, very important. Second one is that policy or the evidence-based policy, the way whole relief operation so scientifically, at least in Bombay, I know very closely that so scientifically they did relief operation. So the kind of uh, corruption, leakage, non uh, wastage was avoided whether it was running of a community kitchen for 20,000 workers in Bivandi or 1,200 workers in Abu Jabadi or 2,000 workers in uh, people in Dharavi. There was a lot of whatever we have taught to our students in terms of need assessment, micro planning. Uh, they, they were doing that. And they, so uh, metadata, nobody trusts now after so, like, the whole NSS or controversy we had. But at least area studies and area-wise data so to come up with a very realistic intervention strategy that is very important. Another thing that uh, this crisis has also shown is that implementation agency, the bureaucratic lethargy, and so many of the uh, uh, elected representatives and uh, even the governance, uh, the heads of the institution, they were only having Zoom meetings after Zoom meetings. In the field, it was only the women's groups, health organizations, uh, civil society organizations, neighborhood societies, some religious organizations who believe in philanthropy, they were found. So I think uh, the governance structure, uh, even after so many advisory, the absenteeism in Maharashtra was 80%, none of the government. So it, only the school teachers were bullied to do. Uh, Asha workers, uh, Agarwadi workers, you are bullied. But those who are getting seventh pay salary, none of them were to be seen. 
So I think what kind of accountability, when we talk about accountability, what is the accountability of this, this section? Why, in spite of so many advisories of state governments to pay the wages of the workers, even the work wage of month of March for which they have worked for 25 days have not been paid. What accountability system do we have for the employers? Do you think that FIKI or all these employers organization don't have their address and mobile number? Workers also, they were making continuous phone calls and their wages were not paid. So I think the accountability system, so many Asian countries, even small for Asian countries, when they talk of accountability, accountability is not only for the working class and the toiling poor. Accountability is there even for the professionals and for the upper class, like Korea yeah, and all you so they, you may call them strong state but there there is accountability in singapore hong kong everywhere for the people in power so here we have seen complete uh, state of absence of accountability. So I say I think more and more the, the, the public, uh, like uh, 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 currently the people's court is going on and uh, uh, the uh, uh, local adalat is going on and uh, currently also on Zoom uh, uh, from the social organization that has to continue. Third one, as I agree with uh, West Maitreyi, when she says that we need more legislations because uh, uh, even in the four labor code nowhere they have made mention about any specific on the contrary whatever we had in 76 equal remuneration act that is also taken away uh, equal opportunity for women equal treatment for women is taken away there is nothing about even when they talk about occupational safety they are not mentioning about sexual harassment of women nothing about the reproductive uh, health of women in the work where 94 percent of women are in informal sector so we need a women specific legislation these four labor codes are not going to give any justice, whether it is economic justice or social justice or distributive justice or gender justice, women are not going to get. So I think this is a very, very retrograde uh, step of just clubbing uh, every, all the labor laws into four labor codes. So we need to oppose to thin nail. And then the also uh, uh, keeping, uh, bringing uh, UNHRC, ILO, UN women constantly in the loop in whatever work that we are doing. So I think from a micro level, to meso level, uh, national level, regional level, and international level. I think it is only social solidarity that is going to bring us this thing. We have seen in course of time, all the initiatives come from civil society organization. After 15 days, the local cell government steps in, then the state government takes one month, and the union government, as you said, is always is absconding. So I think we, that pressure has to be built up, and the, we, can, we can also showcase that the, with very limited human resource and material resource and financial resource, if the civil society organizations and NGOs can do so much uh, in terms of he helping hand and in terms of uh, providing the support system uh, uh, to, to which, uh, for, for, uh, to meet the challenges, why can't state with enormous resources? What is happening with PM Care Fund? Well, all the corporate society, Bollywood, Sports Star, uh, CSR companies, all of them have given their funding only to state government, uh, chief minister's fund and prime minister's fund. What are they doing with such a limited resources when uh, and most of the NGO CSOs, they are, they, are, they are collecting their funds from the, uh, uh, the uh, crowdsourcing. And with crowdsourcing, people like you and professional and middle class and working class, they are the ones who are donating. They can do so much. Why can't state with hundred and thousand times more resources? So I think that questioning has to be done. And I think India will set an example because whatever said and uh, done about our uh, 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 lethargy and bureaucratic inefficiency, there is a freedom of press. Freedom of expression is still there in India, which so many Latin American or uh, Asian or uh, African African countries don't have. We don't even know what is happening. Uh, how are they coping with the COVID virus no? uh, and, and COVID pandemic? So I think this advantage, the democratic space that we have, we should use it to build the pressure. And also, along with building the pressure, also do the solidarity. This time, why do we have moral high? Because we are not giving only empty criticism. We are just not behaving like a consultant of the government. We have owned. Okay, history will never forgive us if we don't do anything at concrete level. That is what from day one all social activists are saying. And that's why whatever resources they have, whether they are in the neighborhood or whether they are in the union or whether they are in Kisan Sabha or whether they are in the urban slums, whether they are there, are the, they're, they're, uh, like some of the 
teachers, I would tell just some transgender people made a panic call. We haven't eaten for five days. Immediately, seven of them got together, they created fund, they prepared the uh, kit in their own homes and take it away. This level of proactive intervention of socially conscious people uh, who are basically from the social science stream, because we have we talk about my uh, uh, informal sector and we teach uh, poverty uh, as an issue and we teach uh, 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 participatory action research and micro planning all that knowledge which they had learned in the classroom they tried to implement it so i think there is a moral high we, we nobody can say that just you are a uh, uh, doing empty slogan mongering no we have actually shown through our day in and day out uh, dedicated as Indu Prakash say that is a 24 7 work of uh, uh, re relief and also uh, hand holding. So I think we, we will have to social solidarity is extremely important. Thank you. Uh, I would like to sum up what others have pointed out. Uh, so I will take about two minutes. What really came out in this kind of presentation as I, uh, what are the my takeaway I would say, uh, share with you, that one is really that there needs to be policies and programs. We are no longer happy only with policies. Somewhere, I, either as communities, we have to also take responsibilities. So policies and programs to reduce the amount of unpaid care work. This would be important. Saying, talking only about attitudes will not help unless we really make, make it in a practice. That would be tough. Uh, so we need more research in this. We need more understanding this. We need more kind of webinars on this. That how is this unpaid care work is really, global data shows that what it has done and it is doing, it came out very clearly in COVID, that what it is doing to women, if they do not perform, uh, well, how much it is increased than violence, beating up and all kinds of driving from home. So the, this has to be the policies and program. My second takeaway is that employer or the state funded provision for child care tax policies that encourage both spheres of work. You should do it. I, I should, should is not really uh, adequate unless it is uh, backed by material forces. And those material forces are, can be the material incentives in terms of, and then these things start working in terms of, so this is the state funded provision of the, and employer, employer market should not be held just like that. I mean, market also should be made responsible when it has become uh, so powerful and colludes with the government. My third uh, in, uh, really take is about women's access to basic infrastructure, skills, uh, mobile phones, digital platforms, and uh, gig economy, everything you can take up that kind of, is it going to be the digital age? They are going to talk about this. And if women are not trained into that, then they would be struggling at a level. So we should prepare the rural women, the indigenous women. I'm talking of this. I'm not talking of Delhi and Bombay women. So that would be the very important. They should have effective access to basic infrastructure, which can be an enabler. And at the same time, women can, it can reduce women's unpaid care work. That would be. And my last thing would be really interventions, very, very critically important. Intervention to address gender norms that attribute biases about women's role in society. And I can give you about 10 examples right now where the gender norms have been addressed, both in our language and also in practice. When the Hindu Succession Amendment Act was passed, yes. it was the whole the Hindu system that was kind of gender norms were changed. That would be the, uh, that is important. So if the government is serious, if we are serious as a community and we don't take care of the kind of cup panchayat and the others which do not allow young women till they have two children that they want to, run away, they can use the phones. So I think community also need to be, we are members of the community, we need to change our attitudes also. So interventions have to address the genders, norms, which we say, oh, it's part of our culture, it's part of the kind of thing. These norms need to be kind of re dismantled and kind of constructed again. So gender norms and more research and more understanding is needed in gender norms. I mean, we don't want the World Bank telling us what we should do. 
and so they came out about women's voice and agency. We should be doing the work and we should be telling them on gender norms. These are my serious kind of four takeaways from today's discussion and whatever the learning I had. So thank you very much. Arjun, over to you uh, or uh, Dr. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for highlighting. I think one, if I can summarize what Chair is trying to highlight is the reconstruction of the norms. And uh, that has to be radical. As many, so many comments are also coming. Uh, I will quickly go to Dr. Mehta and uh, uh, many questions we have here and also in Facebook. So uh, uh, Dr. Simi Mehta, if you'd like to summarize those questions, then we can uh, go once again to Professor Patel. Yeah. Dr. Simi. Thank you, Professor Kelkar, for um, actually Professor Kelkar has uh, already uh, summed up a few questions and that has been presented to uh, Professor Patel. Uh, there are there is actually uh, some question uh, for uh, uh, Miss Urvashi. Uh, I would just read it out uh, and if Ma'am uh, Urvashi, Ma'am can be brief uh, in her response. Uh, the question is quant quantitative data collection often misguides the ground reality as it may not reflect the gendered stereotypes or associated sociocultural practices which discriminate women. How are we going with, to deal with such limitations? Madam, if uh, you could um, respond to that. And uh, overall, uh, to the panelists, if they can just take a minute each and um, focus or talk about what is the way forward. Um, there are challenges and, um, of course, um, things need to be rectified. And uh, how long do you think will be, um, it will be, the time will be needed so that uh, we can uh, usher in a society uh, which is an equal society? So over to you, uh, Urvashi, ma'am, and then... Uh, yeah. Hello? Ma'am's uh, connection is a little weak, I think. Hmm. I think uh, we will come back again with uh, to Urvashi, ma'am. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, if we can start with uh, Professor Samapti, your your views, ma'am, on the way forward and how are we dealing with uh, the most vulnerable women? How can we deal with them? Uh, see, uh, if we think about the most vulnerable, there are several dimensions of the vulnerability. And there, uh, I, I think that uh, one is that local government has a lot of things to do. Uh, now, how we can create the pressure on the local government, that's also a big, very big question. And also, we uh, need to think about that the social organizations who are really working hard, and um, we can also, uh, uh, you know, uh, take their help if, if the local gov government uh, wants to take their help. I think that that's a, a kind of partnership of the different institution. If they can work upon that, uh, from the awareness to uh, you know uh, knowledge creation, and then take them to the mainstream life, I think uh, it's doable. I, I don't uh, uh, say that it is not doable. It is doable, but uh, I think. Uh, Several social organizations already started uh, to work on, on on those lines, you know, to convincing uh, the local governance system and then work with them and also find out the problem where they are not able to do offering the help. Those are the things very uh, and these are a, a problem which is uh, which has a many fold, right? Many dimensions. So. Uh, too quickly, if we think that uh, within two, three months, this uh, just evaporate, uh, I think that there we are very ambitious. So let's wait and see that how it goes, you know? It started, so um, I'm, I'm hopeful. I don't want to uh, say that nothing is going to happen because there are few um, what I would say that when I talk to the uh, more uh, marginalized group in Mumbai, in the, especially from the uh, undeclared slums, not the established slums, 
uh, there I, I see some of the spark also, you know. So give them the chance to grow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Guha. Now we will quickly go to uh, Roshi, ma'am. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, it's yeah, okay. So I'll just quickly answer that question. I'd actually typed it out on the chat as well. I wasn't sure if I'll get time to speak again. But on data, yes, we need, uh, you know, quantitative and uh, qualitative data, obviously. A lot of the aspects about women's agency, attitudes, they come out much better in, in qualitative data rather than in quantitative. But I think my broader point was that we need a dedicated unit uh, which can you know bring all this multifaceted data together, put it out periodically, highlight the issues rather than only when we have a crisis that you know we hear a lot about women's issues or some uh, you know incidents of rape or something very you know unfortunate takes place. We need to highlight this every day because women are facing these issues on a daily basis. So much like Rwanda or a lot of Nordic countries have a dedicated gender monitoring unit, we need to learn from some of those experiences as well and see how we can modify our um, system. And I think just on the final, um, you know, thoughts here, um, I would say that, yes, there's a lot of, you know, sort of restructuring institutionally, I think that we need to do within the government. Coordination, convergence is always a problem. And this is something we face a lot in public health as well. And, and hence, we've been trying to suggest, but a lot of these things take time to happen. Uh, so we keep working hard and we keep trying. And I think as the as the previous panelists said, you know, we, we're not all despondent and we don't give up and I think that nothing will happen. So we keep trying, but these are very systemic, very deep issues, which do take a lot of time. And I think just on one comment, um, you know, on the legislations, I think, I don't think my point was to say we don't need legislations. My point was that let them not just remain on paper, because we've seen a lot of legislations, a lot of policies, which look fantastic on paper, comprehensive, um, but we don't actually get them to the people who really need them. So until we can implement on the ground, monitor that implementation, build the capacity of people who implement them, um, they become somewhat meaningless if they are just, you know, remaining in, in theory or in paper. So I think that was my point there. Thank you. Very much, uh, Samapti ma'am and Ulushi ma'am for flagging, or for giving us some uh, hope and uh, hope for optimism. Uh, I now uh, move to uh, Professor Mehta, if you can, uh, Professor Mehta, are you? Yes. Your. Uh, Hello. Yes, yes, sir. Your. Actually, the microphone is. Uh, yes. If you can keep the mic close to your mouth. Yes, yes, mic there. Yes, now yes. Please go. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, while ma'am speaks, let me uh, come back again and <clears throat> just highlight that ma'am has also highlighted a, a very pertinent issue that, you know, gender-wise COVID testing and other, other medical uh, data which is coming is not available. And uh, uh, from what are in our household experience and others, what we also see that there is also, I would not say discrimination, uh, but uh, th there is also a kind of segregation that women are also not being tested for this COVID-19. So even in this term, ma'am has uh, also from a journalistic point of view highlighted this point. And I would like to thank uh, Handik ma'am again, because she's at hospital caring for her mom. And uh, thankfully she has been able to join from hospital itself. Ma'am, over to you. Oh, I'm at home actually today. I We didn't get the bed in the hospital, but anyway, actually, um, in, uh, India has not done very bad, I mean, hasn't done it, I mean, has done quite well in trying to at least try to implement women-focused schemes. We've had the national mission, the NMPW, you know, and then we've had this wonderful scheme in Kerala called the Kudumshri program, 
which actually uh, nobody talks about it, but because of the Kudum Shri program, we have been able to handle the COVID crisis much better than for any other reason. Because women are generally connected, connected with the, with the, with the community. So this is the kind of uh, you know interflow of system that we require in our programming. But I definitely we need a women-focused uh, legislation because if we have acts on, like for example, Narega at least ensured that there is no discrimination in wage rate between a man and a woman. So in the similar way, and, and let's look at it, there are some acts like the ASPA Act, which is just a couple of paras long. But even if we have a legislation which is just three paras long, we need something on the women-focused legislations. Otherwise, and it is not to say a lot of people are working hard around the country and there are lots of interesting initiative being done. Like, for example, I heard, I heard a landless woman speak two days ago on Zoom. You know, she was struggling 10 years ago just to get a little piece of land. Today, she's one, she's on the forefront of her community. Her name is Sokalu um, Gon. So she's on Zoom telling us what she has doing and what she expects the Forex Rights Act to do. So we basically need a convergence platform. We need, and this is something, I don't know if Ms. Uh, Dr. Uh, Singh, who was um, the mission director of Mission Convergence Plan in Delhi, I don't know whether she's attending today's lecture, but we really require a convergence mechanism. Convergence, and also we have very good institutions. We don't need to create new institutions. We have to actually strengthen. And you know, and this whole talk about capacity building, I think we should try to build capacities of all existing organizations rather than, you know, uh, look at. I'll just keep it short so that someone else can speak. Thank you, Simi. Thank you very much, Nick. Yes, so can we have uh, the final thoughts from uh, Disputi, ma'am, and then uh, after that, uh, Govind, ma'am, and then we can present. Can we try one with Professor Balwan Mehta again? Uh, Professor Balwan Mehta, would you like to make any remark? We can't hear you, sir. Are you able to listen to us? Please go ahead. So I think uh, uh, panelists have also enriched discussion and the summing up by Professor Govind Kelkar was also very important. When it comes to what we do in future, I accept that a uh, lot of in terms of capacity building, awareness generation, challenging the gender stereotypes, and also women-focused legislation, as Ms. Maitri talked about, they are important. And uh, uh, also affirmative action. State has to take up affirmative action. And we have a legacy. Right from 1975, we have had so many affirmative actions we have taken about women in Panchayati Raj institutions, or about Equal Remuneration Act, or social security and social protection. I think that should not be eroded, because this is most dangerous thing that I find is a four labor codes, which are going to take away a lot. And already in 12 states, things are happening. We know just three weeks back, young women in garment industry, apparel industry, they went on strike in uh, Bangalore. Uh, uh, our uh, uh, ASHA workers, they were on strike on the uh, uh, just last week. Uh, and, and, and the kind of uh, uh, inhuman uh, uh, and, and the indignities which they are facing at a ground level, I think that needs to be addressed. And that's why we need legislative and we also need capacity building of the existing uh, uh, structures. And we need to acknowledge more and more, uh, I think, uh, uh, working at a local level, especially strengthening Panchayati Raj institutions, because as I said, in all these six states, Panchayati Raj institutions have done excellent job. Even SHGs in, uh, uh, in all four southern states, they have played a very important role uh, in combating uh, the impact of uh, Corona. So I think we need to take them together and, uh, uh, and, and in future uh, planning and in the uh, unlock period, whatever new reorganization is taking place in that we have to 
or include them and the massive changes that are coming up in msme sector in, in in the economy and even in terms of strengthening of rural infrastructure everywhere it should be gender inclusive that we should be very very uh, conscious and that's why in whatever capacity building programs we are doing i think we need to target the local connection connection sahi nahi ho raha hai pata nahi wo main they are facing the situation front line so local self government bodies should not be treated as a beggars but they should be the center of all the capacity building and the work because then only we will be able to achieve all the macro level targets and macro level visioning that is done for the post covid reality thank you professor patel for uh, uh, again summarizing the deliberation Uh, now i would request to, uh, our chair for for today's session uh, professor govind kelkar to quickly summarize in 2 minutes in the interest of time then i can give a formal vote of thanks uh, professor kelkar i have summarized my uh, four points as a take away uh, so i think i won't like to say anything more it was a great learning session for uh, mutual learning session and uh, we should uh, really learn more from each other that's what I think. right okay on the screen we have some work and uh, also you know this qualitative thing one project we are doing in in the leadership of professor kelkar uh, on village makers like in the era of covid 19 this is a time use survey more than 200 students across the country are doing a rural telephonic survey and uh, uh, we are making all of them make these kind of notes from different parts of the country and raising very pertinent issues and uh, uh, all 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 the students uh, are girls and also boys so you know all these issues we are trying to uh, sensitize and uh, thank you again i think it has been a real treat this morning listening to professor vibhuti patel so comprehensive i mean touching upon the issues from all the uh, uh, you know quantitative and qualitative all different sources of data and issues ma'am have tried to uh, cover up uh, i uh, really commendable i congratulate again uh, the speaker for today and also chair for holding this very successful event so many comments still coming on and uh, without wasting any time uh, uh, on behalf of gender impact study center impact and policy research institute uh, i really want to thank all of all of you who have joined this event and those who will watch this video uh, for being a part of this deliberation and uh, and this talk and i especially like to uh, thank uh, chair for today uh, today's lecture uh, uh, professor govind kelkar and uh, uh, most importantly also the speaker uh, for today lecture professor vibhuti patel for agreeing uh, to give this lecture today uh, on this very important and pertinent issue and uh, and uh, joining us from mumbai and highlighting this thank you ma'am so much i would also like to thank uh, moder our moderator for today dr simi mehta for coordinating this uh, uh, very uh, wonderful event and uh, our discussants for today professor uh, samapti guha from tis mumbai uh, ms urvashi prasad ma'am very uh, thoroughly and touching upon these issues thank you so much ma'am uh, the, the practitioners point from the policy makers and those who are involved in this kind of academic discourse really adds value to to this kind of deliberation uh, thank you so much again ma'am uh, professor ic avasthi uh, for touching upon the issues and uh, and uh, also being the architect of of this uh, event uh, sir has really encouraged us and also connected with uh, professor patel uh, for this very important issue last month i discussed with him and also discussed with our chair professor kelkar and uh, uh, professor mehta and our team and uh, professor balwan mehta uh, again uh, sorry about the technical glitches uh, uh, sir joined us from lucknow and uh, then uh, uh, of course uh, dr indu prakash singh thank you sir for joining for uh, raising the civil society points from the kind of academic and research deliberations we are having and uh, lastly uh, metrai handik ma'am uh, joining from giving you know a journalistic point of view Uh, once again i thank all of you and uh, uh, it was again a, a very nice opportunity for all us uh, all of us to learn from uh, professor vidhuti patel and her work and uh, i wish you all uh, 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 a very good day uh, have a nice day
Thank you very much for Thank the opportunity. You. I have also learned a lot from the deliberations from the uh, Professor Govind Kelkar, all the esteemed panelists, and even the questions that were asked uh, by the participants. It's a very, very educative experience for me too, uh, in, in terms of uh, yeah, the collective wisdom that we all have arrived at. Thank you. And I Thank wish you. you. Thank you. Yes. Have a nice day. Yeah. Thank you.